guys are ready? Oh, sure. Yeah. Ready? Yes. I didn't even tell you about Eric coming? Ready? Yeah, I'll slide your hand. Yeah, that's true. Tell me when you're set. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Joint Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen uh, budget hearings for the Town of Fairfield for the fiscal year 2013, 14 rather, a year behind myself. I'm going to ask uh, members of our state champion boys high school hockey team uh, to come forward to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask uh, the coach, Pedarini, and captains, Mike Aquillo, Dan Silvestri, and Paul Barlow, come forward to lead us in the Pledge along with the assistant coaches. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I don't know, somehow I think we should be doing the Canadian national anthem yeah. as well. <laughs> Just. Do we listen to old Canada? Yes, exactly. So, um, Kind of a unique experience for us tonight. Yeah. Uh, the first selectman and I have been discussing over the past uh, few weeks ways to really honor the individuals within our town who do, do something exceptional or the organizations. Now, that happens that a lot of that comes from our schools. A lot of times on this board and in town government, we speak separately of the town and the Board of Education. And we thought it was appropriate, working with Dr. Title, the Board of Education, uh, Chairman Dwyer, that we actually bring them together in order to recognize accomplishments across our schools and our town as a whole. Now, Mr. Techo couldn't be here tonight due to a family emergency, and I know he deeply regrets that. But we do have two members of our Board of Selectmen here uh, in his stead. Um, now, anyone who knows me personally, including members of my board, have not, um, it's not uncommon for them to reach me where I'm in a hockey rink somewhere along the state with my own kids. And two weeks ago, or a week ago, I happened to find myself in a hockey rink down in New Haven for the boys' high school championship. Uh, and what was unique about that was, for hockey, it's actually a combined team. So it's not Ward versus Ludlow or Republican versus Democrat. It's actually the town of Fairfield with a big F on your jerseys. And you represented us very well. And in fact, I would argue that having been at that game, you guys probably won two state championships that evening. <laughs> one in a last second goal and the other one in a penalty shot at the end. So we congratulate you. We congratulate your hard work and your effort and the way you represented not just your schools, but the town. And we have a proclamation from the Board of Selectmen, so I'll turn it over to them to honor you, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Title as well. Dr. Title, please. I, I goofed up there. It should be you go first. Go ahead, Dr. Title. No, I, I just thought I would have uh, Head Coach Mark Federighi introduce the team members who are here um, so you can hear them by name, and they can be recognized on uh, Television. And perhaps when their names are called, they could come forward and stand up in front, so then when we read the proclamation, we can all see them. Excellent. Go up front and announce. Fantastic. Shall I read it? Mm -hmm. There you go, Coach. Always oh, going to call them up. Uh, we have Wade Petro, P.J. O'Reilly, Kyle Greenhut, Zach Weinstein, Connor Charlop. Alex Pounding, Connor Claflin, Jack O'Rourke, Connor Frawley, Matt LaRouche, Charlie Meter, uh, Logan, Chris Logan, Tim Grace, Kyle Sheets, Captain Paul Barlow, Captain Mike Aquila, Captain Dan Silvestri, Coach John Landino, and Coach Kevin Keating. Good evening, welcome, and congratulations, gentlemen. 
Tonight I'd like to read to you the Town of Fairfield, Connecticut proclamation. Whereas the Fairfield Ice Hockey Co-op team, which is comprised of 26 students from Fairfield Ward High School and Fairfield Ludlow High School, and three coaches, won the Division II state championship, and whereas after winning the last three state tournament games, the team vied for its first state championship in ice hockey, and whereas the Fairfield Hockey Co-op team had a final score in the championship game of four to three in overtime, and how old is people? Oh, thank you. Whereas the town salutes Captain Mike Aquila, co-captains Dan Silvestri and Paul Barlow, along with Connor Frawley, Connor Charlop, Kevin Robinson, Charlie Meter, Matthew LaRouche, Chris Logan, Tim Grace, Tom Crispin, Rhett Adenolfi, Austin Armas, Kyle Sheets, Henry Kreitler, Zach Weinstein, Jack O'Rourke, Matt Stern, Alex Pounding, Patrick Mims, Will Fulda, Kyle Greenhut, PJ O'Reilly, Wade Petro, Matt Roberts, and Connor Claflin. And whereas the town commends the coaches, parents, and the entire school community for their support in helping these remarkable athletes achieve their goals. Now therefore we, Kevin Kiley and Kristen McCarthy Vahey, members of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Fairfield, do hereby proclaim March 28, 2013, Fairfield Ice Hockey Co-op Team Day in the town of Fairfield, Connecticut. And congratulate these talented players. I just want to quickly echo Mr. Flynn's thanks as the wife of a hockey player. I think it's amazing what you guys have done, and I, and I uh, just want to say sorry to the Ludlow guys who are having to wear the ward colors, but see, that's a sign of unity. It's bipartisan. That's right. Exactly. Now the press has asked that you guys get a little bit closer together so that Great. we can get a picture yes. of you. Please sit down. We're right in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. On top of that, shit. to stay to see some exciting budget discussion. Thank you, congratulations. Well, March 28th is only for 2013. We have another team coming in next year. He's late. He forgot. He was in jail. I guess right, it is. It is. Next week, next week, it'll be very pretty. Oh, there we go. I am waiting for that. All right. No one can say we don't know how to clear out a room. Yeah, right. All right. Let's go. So, on our agenda for this evening, 
um, is a discussion, an open discussion, about the budget that was before us. Now, uh, one of the items we're going to go through tonight is we're going to turn it over to Mr. Mayor and ask, to, ask him to walk us through um, some of the adjustments that have been identified since the first selectman proposed the 6.3, 6.4 budget increase, as well as some other documents that he's prepared that give us some options as we look at the budget um, going into our vote as of next week. This evening is meant to be a free-flowing conversations, questions, uh, follow-up items, as well as any public comments that any board member would like to make regarding the budget if, if they so choose. There's no, uh, you're not compelled to do so, but feel free if you want to let everybody else know what you're thinking on the budget. So with that in mind, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you to walk us through the documents, including the adjustments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I begin, let me just uh, mention that on, on your tables, the chairs, wherever, uh, before the meeting started, uh, the clerk, the Board of Finance, left you four new reports, uh, plus the latest uh, co hard copies of the latest uh, emailed reports to make sure everybody had a copy. Four new reports are uh, based on the follow-up of questions that asked by the board. The simplest one is uh, municipal uh, finance department uh, staff comparatives uh, for the towns with the population approximately uh, equal to uh, town of Fairfield. <coughs> So this includes all towns from 55,000 to 86,000 in the state of Connecticut. Second item is a request for the adjustments that were made to the budget to uh, address the reduction in the contingency by the RTM last year. That's titled uh, Final 2013 Adjustments, total $634,000. Third item is the uh, branch Fairfield Woods Branch Library analysis. Um, if the Fairfield branch was uh, discontinued, and the fourth item, hot off the press, so to speak, about four o'clock this afternoon, actually, is the uh, variance analysis, the latest and greatest variance analysis for the eighth months ended February 28th. Um, there is an item on here, uh, the third item from the top, bond premium for fiscal year 14. Uh, that item, based upon the latest analysis, it would seem that we, if we, if we leave 500000 of this year's bond premium in the debt service account, to use to reduce bond service costs next year uh, that would allow the board to uh, to reduce this year's uh, budget by 500,000. Um, reduce the five, the but that number is not in the documents right. that you have, uh, the, the latest documents that were issued uh, that have the 4.36 percent, the ones we're going to go through today. There's a lot of work put into trying to get a real handle on what the variance is. Uh, Caitlin Bossi, Juliana Santiago, uh, Linda Gardner, uh, myself, uh, you know, the town has, I don't know how many hundreds of object line items, and it's not, and we don't have a budget by department, so to speak, uh, certainly on the revenue side. And, uh, but there's a incredible amount of work put in. You know, it would appear that this is, a reasonable document, but I cannot swear by it by any means. So, so Mr. Mayor, what you're saying is, if if we decide not to use, or if we plan on using that 500,000 as a reduction of of bond payments next year, uh, we're exposing ourselves this fiscal year because this analysis. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it shows it would have an estimated variance of 365,000. Right. And in addition to that, there's 500,000 dollars in the budget 
to strengthen the unassigned fund balance. But that's so really we have like an eight hundred and sixty five thousand. But that was budgeted. That's not yes. part of the variance. Correct. The variance is three sixty five. Correct. And through your comments, what I'm saying what I'm gleaning is there's a fair amount of risk to that three sixty five. You could be higher than that, you could be lower than that. You know, I don't think that yeah, yes. I mean the town is I don't think and I don't know this for a fact, which is based upon the work that we've done. I'm not sure that there's been such a rigorous analysis of uh, to produce a variance analysis number, um, but it's the first time through. So inherently, so, we're, so we're, we're basically, you know, there's some new reports generated, new work, you know, work, a lot of work done, a lot of effort, and you know, I, I feel fairly comfortable with it, but you know, it's, it's and you know, we'll work on it some more. Can, do my colleagues Maybe next week? Can I ask one more question and then turn it over? Um, so what this analysis shows is that we used up essentially two million dollars of the premium from the bond sale in the first year to offset um, other items in the budget for this year. Yeah, primarily uh, the cost of Storm Sandy, the cost of Storm Nemo, and the reserve for other anticipated expenses that was. Right. So, so those items were, if we hadn't had that premium, we would have been in it, had a problem there, but we had the bond premium. Correct. So that saved us. Right. You're saying here there is an opportunity for us to use 500000 from that bond premium and move it over into 2014 and lower the tax increase. But if we do that, we're exposed in the current fiscal year. Yeah, I think... Uh like I said, lots of caveats, but I would not have produced this document right. if I didn't think it was a reasonable estimation and expectation. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Brockfeld. Actually, I think you, you kind of, I just, I just wanted to make sure, I mean, for everybody's sake, including my own, that we walk through the bond premiums. So it's a little complicated. So I'm just going to repeat, I think, what Tom said, but if you don't mind, for my own uh, edification. So we had a $2.9 million bond premium. Was that the full bond premium? Yes, sir. From, okay. And we chose or budgeted to use it entirely for the year we're in now. Is that correct? We did not budget what to we use budget? it. We, we budgeted to use 320000 of it. We, we did not budget right, I'm sorry, right. to we, use the entire but thing. But we've chosen to use it. Because of all these because other of all the overages. Things, right. yeah. And now you're saying that because things are not as, I don't want to use the word bad, but, but well, but I, I'm not, I'm not, as, I, as I can't quite, I, I can't quite put things exactly the way I think you're putting them, Mr. Brackfield. And, and, in, and in talking to bond council and uh, you know, audit partners and, and other CFOs, this is a pretty common thing. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Secondly, you know, I can't tell you, you, you have two choices with this. If you take the scenario that we didn't have the the, un, the, the million dollar unfavorable from the storms and the $1.2 million unfavorable from the Reserve for Anticipated Expenses activity, okay, then, you would have, then the town would have had two options to use this bond premium. Yep. One option would have been to take it straight to fund balance mm -hmm. by reducing this year's debt service and increase our unassigned fund balance by, you know, $2.5 million. Second option would have been to spread it out over the next three-year period. There's a differentiation in the IRS rules if you use bond premium within three years or over three years. The, re the reporting requirements, the tracking requirements, the arbitrage uh, issues are much more severe if you go over three years. So you, so you must use uh, it in the first three years. So that would have been our, th that would have been our two choices, take it in now or use it to uh, reduce <coughs> debt service and therefore the tax burden each of the next three years. Okay. I, I, We're all saying similar things. Right. Right. Any other questions, Mr. Brown? Thank you. So we're saying with this summary that Storm Sandy cost the town $575,000? Um, this is a number that's jumped around a lot uh, for a couple of different reasons. One getting a handle on the actual numbers. One of the things that Ms. Bossy and I talked about um, yesterday, I think, 
was setting up as separate accounts, storm accounts, that next time, if there is a next time, that instead of people uh, recording their overtime and their equipment purchasers and their contracted service, the extra expenses in the, in the regular chart of accounts, that there would be another set of accounts where these uh, expenses would be documented. So it would be much easier to break them out and differentiate. To be segregated. Yes. Thank so you. This, is, this is an estimate. Right. So this, so the second thing is understanding the FEMA rules. Right. And then the third thing is getting all the documentation together and trying to make sense out of it. But this is, uh, I, I think, a given, I, I think everybody is, is on board that this is probably a decent number. Okay. And then we have NEMO at 465,000, same explanation, I would. Yeah, NEMO is, obviously, was a smaller storm, and it's the amount's almost the same, so you say, well, that doesn't make sense, except that the FEMA reimbursement time frame for Sandy was like 10 or 12 days or, or some number, plus allowing some extensions for certain types of uh, expenditures. But for NEMO, it was a strict 48 hours. So the total extra expense for NEMO was about 662000 and then, but, the, but there was a 48-hour period that we'll get 75% reimbursement on, and the net out of fallout out of that is 465. So, okay, so back to Storm Sandy, is that 575 then net of reimbursement? Oh, okay. yes, yeah, okay. this is our cost, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Any other questions on this item? And just, there was a, some, there's some cushion that I applied to that um, because of a, a level of uncertainty on some of the reimbursement requests. Percentages. Questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you want us to turn to the adjustments document now? No, actually what I'd like to do is uh, walk you through a little some comments that I wrote up here. Yep. On uh, which document? That there isn't a document, just a little, a little script I have here. Okay. That I'm going to uh, bless you with here. Um, bless us briefly. You got it. Well, it'll, it'll explain everything. Um, as I stated in my initial presentation to the Board of Finance, when uh, the budget was first presented, the budget is a work in process. It's a work in process. It starts in September. It's not complete until the RTM votes in early May. There's two primary reasons that it's a work in process. One, the budget preparation process starts early, and there's limited town current information. And secondly, there are accounts on both the revenue and expenditure side of the budget that are very uncertain in the early stages. Examples, the governor's budget, health care costs, and any salary, wage, and benefit adjustments that may accrue from labor negotiations. So what I'm going to do now is walk, is walk us down the trail from the decimal 638 to today's decimal uh, 4 decimal 36. Des 4 decimal 36. First, taking revenue into account. There are three major categories of revenue adjustments in your accounts analysis. One's from operational adjustments, the second one's tax collection rate adjustment, the third one is uh, what I'm calling, for lack of a better term, an accounting methodology change. The, there are three uh, elements in the operational adjustments. Town dump and conservation uh, revisions represent unfavorable change of a total of $110,000 combined. The uh, changes resulted from a combination of pencil sharpening by conservation and operational adjustments in the town dump uh, reducing the planned uh, number of days open by half a day. And there's savings on the expense side that offset that as well. There's approximately a $250,000 unfavorable ch change from accounts that were carried over from prior year's budget. And upon examination, it's clear that the numbers were overstated. And um, there's an additional $200,000 increased revenue or favorable change in building permits revenue uh, because there's an expectation of increased activity from Storm Sandy. Those netted out to $165,000. The two largest revenue item changes are from the tax collection rate and inclusion of an accrual for assessment appeals. In regard to the change in the tax collection rate, when we started preparing the 2014 budget, we had the work papers from the final year from the prior year which showed an initial tax collection rate estimate of 98.63 used in last year's working papers to prepare the initial 
fiscal year 13 budget. <coughs> At that time, we also had become aware that the tax collector reports from prior periods did not adjust for overpayments. In fact, you may remember that for fiscal year June 30, 2012, was the first year the town accrued a liability on our financial statements for tax overpayments. That accrual was $575,000. Additionally, as a result of the conversion to the QDS tax software and new personnel in the tax collector's department, we didn't have clear, consistent information from that office as to what our historical rates were. So given this, we started with the 98.63. We reduced it downward a little bit to adjust for the overpayment issue. In early March, the tax collector's office provided us with the <clears throat> with what we're pretty confident is accurate and correct information with the last three years tax collection rates adjusted for overpayments for the last year but not for the prior two years because that information is lost in history. <clears throat> this allowed us to increase the collection rate from 98.52 percent to the current 98.83 percent. By itself this change had a favorable impact to the budget of $908,000. The other significant adjustment to revenue, uh, what I'm calling a change in accounting methodology, is related to tax adjustment appeals. As a result of the property revaluation of the 2010 grand list, a small percentage of residential and commercial property owners appealed their assessments. Some of these appeals will not be finally adjudicated until fiscal year 2014. Some will be successful, and the town will be required to reimburse those successful appellants for the taxes they paid in fiscal years 12 and 13. Because a portion of those required reimbursements relate to this year and last year, it is appropriate to record that liability, I believe, in the June 30 financial statements. I spoke with our partner, Cohen Resnick, who stated that he was unaware of anyone doing this in Connecticut but that properly documented and estimated it would be a reasonable accrual. Therefore, we plan to make that accrual in our fiscal year 2013 financial statements, and it's included on the variance analysis sheet that you have. I think it's the second number from the bottom, $710,000. So the combination of those items on the revenue side reduced the tax requirement by about 0.56 or down to about 5.82 from the original 6.38. Do you want to talk about any of those before I move on to expenditures or would you like me to go ahead? Anybody have anything? A lot of these items we walked through at our table previously or expected some adjustment on, but any other questions, <laughs> comments on these items? Mr. Walsh? Can you just explain to me why I heard what you were saying, but it just seems like this tax rate collection change just keeps changing. I got a feeling like we're going to get another email tomorrow saying it's changed again. Um, and we're trying to like put together cuts and it's just kind of hard to, to do that without having full knowledge of if that, that number's changed three times in... No, it's changed once. This is the only time it's really... Well, there was one in the budget book that Mike put out, right? But 98.5... Five two. Okay. And this one. And then there was another potential adjustment page, right? So that changed again. No, the tax collection rate. Okay. I, I think I think Mr. Walsh is right. There was the one You issued I, this the other day. Right. You issued okay, this well, the okay. other day. This Are you, okay, you're talking page. about okay, you're talking about hundreds, and I'll tell you why you're talking about hundreds. The mill rate can only go out to thousands can't go out to ten thousands. So whenever you change or make a revision in any expenditure or in any revenue item, the, uh, it, you have a rounding issue because you're limited with going out to thousands. That rounding issue gets impacted and it sh shows up in the, in the collection rate. That's where you make the adjustment. So you, you probably have a couple of them that are, like one might be 98.81 or something, 98.83. I don't know what they are, but whenever. Those are so exactly what they are. Yeah. But, but, it's, but it's 100, or it's $50,000, whatever it is. Yeah. But it is, I mean, Mr. Walsh is right. The collection rate yeah. has moved around. It's moved around, but it's, it's unavoidable. 
Well, well but his question. My question is, is it unavoidable? Okay. okay. In, well, in no, it's unavoidable that that number changes unless you pick that number and then back, go backwards. Uh, do you have the list of, um, did you have the three-year tax? No, Mr. Mayor, I, I think, let Mr. Walsh rephrase this question just so that we know. Do you have the three-year? Go ahead. I guess the question is, the administration's been working on the budget for four months. You've had a lot of time to work with the tax collector to work on work, worksheets, which I presume is the previous fiscal officer is what you're talking about. And we've had three changes to this tax collection rate change, which I guess I'm questioning why it's happening again today when we're all spending time trying to find cuts and trying to find not, you know, abilities not to affect services, not to affect bodies, things like that. And the number just keeps jumping around. I don't understand it with working with the tax collector, why after four months we're still getting two changes to that number in a week. Actually, I shouldn't even say a week. We've had two changes in 48 hours. Um, I explained it and I'll explain it again. And I don't know when you actually walked in the room. I heard the full uh, discussion on that. Um, okay, good. The current numbers that we're using based from the tax collector for 10, 6, 6.30.2010 is 98.88. 6.30.2011 is 98.93. 6.30.2012 is 98.85. I believe, though not with certainty, that the 98.85, which as you notice, is the lower of those three numbers is because the prior years did not, were not adjusted for tax overpayments. Okay? So this information, so we used the 98.52 or 57 until we got this information in early March. When we got this information in early March, I instructed the budget director when doing the rounding to not go over 98.85. So whenever we make adjustments, like if you adjust it a million dollars, then you adjust your, then you need a million dollars more in taxes. But because of the rounding impact, it doesn't go dollar to dollar to the tax to the taxes collected. You have a rounding impact, as I just said, and that rounding impact will have a uh, thousandth of a percent, or is that a ten thousandth of a percent? A thousand, thank you. A thousandth to two thousandths to three thousandths of a percent impact on the tax rate. So yes, you see different numbers, but the folk, the reason the numbers are different and maybe this is why prior people never handed out the numbers. They wouldn't have to answer these kind of questions. I don't know. But the, the point is that we've changed the number once. Well, now you've, you've changed it three times. Yeah, and we'll change it again every time you make an adjustment. The number will change. Okay, and the question gets back to, I, I just don't understand, why was it adjusted from Tuesday to Thursday? Because of rounding. From... 98.81 to 91 to, to from excuse me 98.81 to 98.83 there was some rounding adjustment that got done in the last 36 no, no, because hours. the numbers got changed I, w I don't know what your number is on the 98 point what 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 was your tax rate on your 98 point it's a different tax now so there's there's additional um, adjustments made that, that's a, that's a it's later schedule with follow-up adjustments made which changes the number. I understand why there's tax. Hey, I think, is that the number that added the $500,000? Are, are you saying the collection rate is falling out, Mr. Mayor, from yes, the sir. hard dollar numbers as opposed to, so you're not, this is where the struggle is. You're not actually dictating the collection rate down to the, the hundreds or the thousands. You're actually dictating the number down to the hundreds or the thousands. So the rounding changes in the calculation of the collection rate by that amount. Well said, thank you. Yeah. Because now, now I'm getting confused. Uh, first. <laughs> me, me too. Yeah. Help me out. Um, 
Until Tom said anything, I was totally okay. But no. Um, that's not the last Tom, time that's going to happen, by the way. Um, what Tom said was exactly right, though. I guess where I'm getting a little confused by this is not really the concern about, about the, you know, the number of times that there may or may not have been a change in the printed number. I mean, what I'm hearing, or I'm not really completely understanding, is I'm looking at you as much as to Bob because you just said it in a way he said Because I said it. Right? Yeah. I said it the way I understood it. How are we com in, other words, in my imagination, we, we look at the uh, past couple of years' experience. We look at, uh, you know, and, and say this is what we think the collection rate That's will right. be for next year. That's right. What I'm hearing is something a little different, like we're backing into the collection rate, like almost like what we want, which doesn't make any sense to me. Well, what you said was correct until you said what we want. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell me why that's not. I think this is what they mean close enough for government work. Yeah, right. No, but you know what I'm no, saying? No, I don't think, I think. I think it's an unfair statement, Mr. Flynn. No, I was teasing. Right. But, Thank uh, you. But maybe I'm not, under, I'm not understanding. In other words, again, just to repeat myself, the, the collection rate that we forecast should be a forward-looking collection rate based on our best possible judgment, based on our, our hist recent history, our right. expectations. We, for we, the we have a mill rate government. we have to achieve. Say again? A mill rate. You have to achieve a mill rate. So you know what would be a helpful? mill rate only goes out to right. to one hundreds. Okay, I can't adjust the mill rate beyond the hundreds. Right. Okay, because I can't adjust the mill rate beyond the hundreds. Right. I have to change my collection rate to match my revenue collection to equal the expenditure requirement. So because of that, you have a rounding. Can I Where are you going to take, put the rounding? There's no I other ask, place to put it. Let me ask one more question here, because I'm understanding what you're saying, which is scaring the bejeebus out of me. No. Uh, <laughs> um, so what you do is, okay, is uh, get me here. The collection rate is 98.8, right? That number, the 98.8, is driven by, like you said, you can bring the mill rate out to the to the hundredth, right? So that goes to 98.8. That next tenth kind of just falls out because you can't adjust the mill rate anymore. Correct. Right? So whether that's 98.81, 98.82, it just falls out of the calculation on that little sliver at the end. Correct. And then sometimes, like, you, you increase 10 bucks right. and it goes boom. But, okay, may I? Yeah, please. I, and I, I have a feeling this is just math. I'm just trying to get my hands around it. I don't think there's anything ideological here, but it sounds to me like it's reversed, though. It sounds to me like the mill rate's driving the direct collection rate when it should be the collection rate only driving because, the mill rate. Only because, only to that tenth of a decimal. And it's only because, as Mr. Mayor said, you can't bring the mill rate out any further. So the calculation, if I hear him correctly, is true up until the 98.8. But after the 0.8, when you go to the... 0 0.83, 0 0.82, right. the 0.81, of a percent, yes. the thousandth of the percent. Right. You can't adjust it anymore because there's no digit that you can change in the mill rate. Right, because you can't change the mill rate. And is so you either have to, right. you know, but you have to increase your expenditures or decrease your expenditures or, or let the rounding fall through to but, the collection but, ratio. And if anybody here can jump in, please do. But again, I don't understand only because the mill rate is something that hasn't been set yet. We set the mill rate in May or something. It's, so a, I, it's assumed based on the rest of the numbers here. You do the expenses, you do the revenue. It comes out to here's the dollar value that you need. Right. It's basically the number that falls out. Bob then goes ahead and says that dollar value requires this mill rate. That mill rate only goes to a certain percentile. You plug that in oh, okay. and you say my collection rate I, goes okay. out to 98.8. Okay, so so, 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 so we're talking about here is the, is the 0 .03 or 0 .04. Exactly. That, that's the fallout. That's the fallout. Right. Okay. Do you got, is, that that, okay? is that a correct? Hey, that's why totally I correct. I okay. guess so. Sorry it took so the long. The only question I have is. No, it's confusing. Have okay. we ever historically done this? Because I don't remember this discussion ever coming up in my 15 years of being involved. Never have I remembered this thing adjusting at the very end to the, tweak the, that the, number. The, uh, I guess the, I asked the budget director, I understand too. it. That's be, if you look at the budget book, the, the, the piece of paper that's in your budget book this year, which is titled Schedule of Property Tax Available for Taxation, 
mill rate calculation, gross tax levy, and projected tax revenue is a new document. This document has been, it was presented so that everyone could get a sense of the line items and the change in line items uh, last year to this year. What was in the prior budget documents, if anyone has a prior budget book, was only the change. And the tax collection rate was never included in the budget book. Let me, let me stop you on one point there. And I'm going to agree and disagree. You're absolutely right in terms of that's a new schedule, right? But every year we've reviewed the tax collection rate and reviewed it as compared to where we're coming in in the prior year. And maybe every is a bad word. But for the last number of years, we've taken a hard look at the collection rate when we've done the revenue side of the budget. We have looked very specifically at the collection rate. Mrs. Gardner, you'll remember there was analysis done on what is the collection rate, where do we stand, where do we stand year to date. Paul Hiller used to do it. There was like last year's initial tax collection rate was 98.63. It ended up at, right. give me a, a different number. Right, because we adjusted it. Right. That's absolutely correct. We changed yeah. the assumption. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and you're absolutely right. In, in the final, in, on the vote night, there was always a discussion what would the collection rate be and how does it relate to prior. So there was also, a, there was a, there was a discussion twice. There was a discussion at the beginning of the budget process, and then there would always yeah. be a discussion at the end of the budget process for any new information. We always looked at the collection rate. Right. Right. So I guess my question, I guess, and maybe, Linda, you can help us out since you have the historical background for this. We've never done this before. This is a new methodology of changing this number around before we vote. Putting like it this, down on the rounding. Putting it down on paper. Is, is new. We probably did it, uh, we, we, we did it at, uh, at your last Board of Finance meeting when you set the mill rate. Yeah, well, I understand that. That's at the end of the process well, after the RTM has gone through We've it. done it during the budget process, too, when, we've, when we've, we've looked at the collection rate every year. No, but you looked at the collection rate, but you didn't have this last minute adjustments up or down regarding the rounding we, of these dollars. Not rounding. We've had last minute adjustments based on better available information. Yeah. And there's no question. But not about rounding right. of these Could, dollars. No, it's been about better collection better experience. Collection experience. Right. I, think, I think, Jim, you're right. I think yeah. you're, you're, we're talking about two different yeah. things. Yeah. There's no question we've discussed what the That's appropriate correct. collection rate is. But I think Jim is getting at, is correct, that this is a new wrinkle, which is basically, it sounds to me like, we assume a collection rate, yeah. then that spits out a mill rate. I think I'm yeah. getting this now. And then that forces you to come back and tweak the collection rate a, sm a smidge. Is that right? Because of the rounding you're talking about. And that's the new. It, it depends on where you want to take the rounding, because if you yep. look at last year's budget book, we rounded other numbers to make that collection rate come out on mm -hmm. the on the nose. Mm -hmm. Right. A and it just depends on where you want to take right. your rounding. So the rounding part you're talking about is between the 0.83 and the 0.81. Yes. It's not between the 98.6 and the 98.8. That is an actual fallout of better information. It's the rounding that's th that's the difference. Yeah, and, and what uh, Ms. Gardner just indicated was that the, the other way to go would be to adjust one of the expenditure or revenue items right. to make it equal. Yeah. You know, you know like you could, uh, you know, you know uh, supplemental car tax. You just, you know, change it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, I guess that's what I didn't, that was the misunderstanding because you guys have a little bit of a new philosophy on this, and I guess we should probably be brought up to speed when you decide to do something like that because it has some drastic changes. I mean, it, it, it moves the, the needle slightly. Well, this this so. is more exact, is that we, will be, we are using the revenue items and the expenditure items that this group will adopt as a, and then the, the, based upon those numbers that you adopt, the tax collection rate will fall out as a result of the rounding as opposed to using the tax collection rate and then massaging the numbers you adopt to make it equal that. Okay. So that's the difference. So going forward, this is the way we're going to be doing it. I just want to make sure that every year is consistent, that this is going to be the new way we're going to do it so that next year is not something else. So I think this is the appropriate way to do it, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Brockfeld. Well, can I move to the uh, line below it? 
Can we ask one more question yeah. on this one then? Go ahead. Um, anybody before me? This collection rate, what's our current collection rate this year? <laughs> That's something you don't know to the end of the year. Where do we stand year to date? And where do we stand year to date versus prior year? That we do know. That we do know, and I don't know if I brought that schedule. And we only know that through, well, it's not a true statement. Um, I, remember, I know I have, I don't remember the latest time I looked at that. Well, what's important is to know where we think we're going to come out. Is there any concern we have that we're not going to hit? You said we budgeted 98.85 last year? No. For this year? 630.12, the actual was 98.85. What's 630.13? What did we budget at? One moment. I th we have that. Good. It ended up being, you guys want to do an over-under pool? 98.47. 98.47. Okay, and, where, and what did we budget for this year? The current year we're in? That, that's what I'm saying. The current year approved is 98.47. Okay, okay 98.47 is the current is year Which is significantly below the historical averages. Where, how, are we on, how are we pacing this year? Right. Today, that's that's the schedule I was looking for. I, was actually, I actually thought I put that in my package today. I just want to make sure, now that we know how it's calculated, I just want to make sure we're comfortable year over year with how it's. Given that we're about 0.5 below prior years, I hope we are. So do I. Say that again, I'm sorry. Are we point five below? But hope isn't a strategy I want to know. That's a better number. It's a higher number. Well, he's going to find out where we are this year. Yeah, he's raising it up. Yeah. Well, and that's why. And Mr. Walsh brings out a good point. Last year's actual came out at 98.47. The question is why are you raising it from 98.47 if that was last year to 98.83 No, no, year? La last year's budget, 98.47. And what was the actual? Was, that's the, was the actual it? number I gave you, I'm sorry, was? 98.83, wasn't it? That was 2012. 98.85. That was 2012. 2012. 2013 isn't here yet. Right. right, but we're seeing where we stand year to date. Right, that's... I do have that schedule. I thought I brought it. I don't, and I'm hoping okay. that it's in we Linda's. Can, we, can, we can follow up on that, okay? I just, before we vote, I want to make sure we know what that is. a good is. question. Yeah. All right. Um, and Mr. Brockfeld, was it you who said you wanted to go on to expenses? or? Something? No, actually, I wanted to go to the line below it, the, oh, okay. um, the other adjustment. Feel free. Um, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I totally follow the logic of the $710,000 adjustment, right? So first of all, I mean, I guess you should be applauded for finding what sounds like a novel idea about how to uh, make an adjustment that, that will help relieve the, the tax burden this year. But the same at the same time, my question to you, I guess, is you said that, as far as you know, nobody's ever, no municipality's ever done this before in the... According to Mr. Santafani, he's not aware of any Connecticut municipality that does this. It, it's not... But it, but it's certainly in accordance with GAP, and it's certainly a reasonable thing to do. And his indication was that properly documented, it's okay. So he, he wouldn't, he would not, even if we talked about it. To, to say what he said, he says, I wouldn't have you make it, but if you make it, it's it's appropriate and the correct matching of revenue and expense. Okay, so I guess the two questions to the to the, yeah. to the time period. So one is you're kind of answering it if Mr. Senefani is. I don't know if, we're, if blessing is the right word, but if he was here, he probably wouldn't like that. But is there any risk with the rating agencies of, of doing something that, while it may be legal or gap legal, is not, uh, you know, not customary? It's actually more conservative because you're matching it with the year to which it relates. Right. It, would, it would be a benefit to the rating agencies, in the rating agencies' eyes. A, a positive.
positive. You're matching it up with no, the I year in which right. it, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, okay. Thank you. Who had this? Because this is very good. There's a Mary. history. Thank you, Mary. There's a history of the collection rates here, just so that we're aware. Going back to 2005, uh, how I wish we could go back to 2005. There's 99.99. 99.04, 99.92 in 08, 99.9 in 09, 98.86 in 10, 98.90 in 11, 98.86 in 12. So the question is, do we know why that continues to come down a little bit? Any idea? Well, I, I think that 12 is down because 12 is uh, adjusted for tax overpayments right and that's what you're taking into account so basically what you're saying is the prior years are a little bit overstated due to tax overpayments that correct were, that were counted in these numbers correct so we're right in the ballpark thank you yeah I, I, my instructions to the budget director were stay stay at the bottom side the lower side do you have any other questions on that item and how is the 710 calculated? Uh, the um, based upon the uh, assessment valuation that is under appeal, combined with the uh, average rate of uh, appeal result. So you have some type of calculation on that number? Yeah. I have Do you have that. it here? No. All right. I'm going to need to see that number um, and how, you, how that calculation, what is some, every assumption that goes into it that you've made? Sure. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Why don't we go on to the adjustments on the expense side? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, news flash. Uh, tax collections year to date uh, to budget this year 76 decimal one one. Uh, last year at this point 75.92. So we're ahead. So we're ahead. Decimal zero nine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Mills. And thank good staff. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor, on to the expense side, and thank you. Uh, expense sides, basically, there's five sources of adjustments. The biggest one is health care. The second one is contingency. The third one is the uh, adjustments from the uh, finalization of the actual aerial valuation. The uh, fourth one is fire department uh, adjustments resulting from all the promotions that took place after the initial budget started. And the last one is department head adjustments. The health care adjustments come from two sources. First, improved activity. Uh, the original budget was through, I think, information through November on the board of Ed, December on the board of, uh, on, for the town. The latest information we have is through February activity. And that, and that adjustment uh, resulted in a $1.63 million uh, favorable change. Mr. Mayor, before you continue on the Board of Ed side, just so that we're all clear, um, Mr. Tetro's submitted budget that came to the 6.3, 6.4 increase had included in there a revision downwards 1.1 million of the Board of Ed. And I, I know the answer to this question. I just want to make sure we get it in for the record here. We're not double counting that. So this is in addition. In addition to that 1.1 million, we're now looking at a, a total of 2.4 for an additional 2.3, 1.3. Okay. So, so the entire adjustment to the Board of Ed budget related to health insurance is 2.4 million, right? Which 
is the 1.1 that Mr. Tetro had already included based on the better information plus this 1.3. I mean, Dr. Title, you guys have uh, reviewed that 2.4 and you guys are quote unquote comfortable with that. You've reached the same conclusion that the administration has. Yeah, please. And thank you for coming tonight. Yeah, sure. I was really just here to watch, but if you insist on asking me a question, I'll feel compelled to answer it. <laughs> uh, yes, we're in agreement. Um, we've run this through our uh, profit and loss um, statement that you've, it's in the Board of Ed budget, and um, we can adjust based on the experience by the total of 2.4 million and still, still be above the one time IBNR level on the reserve. Okay. So is everyone clear on that? Yes. Sir. And what they're doing? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Title. There's an additional $125,000 savings that results from the additional co insurance payments for employees from settled union contracts. And uh, thirdly, for health care, Dr. Title and the first Leckman had an RFP issued earlier in the year to determine if we could reduce health care costs through that process. Savings from the bidding process have resulted in a favorable change, which is realizable without changing from our current medical carrier anthem of $743,000. So the total impact of those three changes generated by themselves a, a, a favorable tax impact of 0.98%. Any other questions on these items? Mr. Walsh. Mr. Mayor, what does it mean when it says additional potential? Is that a guaranteed um, number or is that a potential number? Because you say additional potential adjustment on both the BOE and the town um, adjustments for the bidding process. Actually, um, that was put in there, that language was put in there when I was using my estimation, uh, which actually turned out to be pretty close. And those numbers that the 400,000 and the 343,000 are uh, locked in at this point. All right, so you can adjust your form and resubmit it and say guaranteed savings, correct? I, I, I just don't want to sit here and think we're going to have a potential and then it not, not appear. So I would like something, if you have a letter from Anthem that says that these were going to be the savings and you feel that confident in it, I'd like the administration to put that down in writing. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, <laughs> secondly, those are from Anthem. So that's, if we keep the current health insurance, that's what the savings are going to be based on various cost adjustments, correct? With the claims experience uh, um, estimates, correct. The only guaranteed savings mm -hmm. are in the administrative. Yes. Okay. And there's potentially, after you finish your bidding process, because the RFP is completed, is that correct, and that you're interviewing these carriers, correct? Yes, sir. Is there a process after you do this that you have to get union approval on this? The... Um, Results of the bidding process when we got the final and best numbers from the uh, from the um, you know the, the companies that responded to the RFP uh, have a uh, it would be a slight additional cost to the town if we switched from the anthem proposal of about a hundred thousand dollars and there would be a potential savings to the Board of Ed um, and definitely using the word potential in this sentence uh, of about my recollection is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars yeah I think it is I think it is Dr. Todd if you have better information yeah. why don't you step up yeah, uh, but it's, it's, there's, yeah. A, there's a million there, on one carrier. And, yeah, uh, there's two different, two different carriers in addition to Anthem in play. Um, and, and this has got, it's more complicated. <laughs> That's why it's taking long. Originally, we talked about having it ready like right now, but as this thing's unfolded, there's a lot of nuances, there's a lot of permutations to this. Um, and so, and, and the short answer to your question about the unions is that I know on the board side, I can speak to the board side, um, that um, we are allowed to change carriers provided we meet the provisions in the collective bargaining agreement. Um, some of them say substantially equivalent, 
You know, lawyers love this stuff. Some say substantially comparable. You know, they all have different, there's different standards there. And so that's part of our, our calculation is um, there's a risk in changing carriers that at some point um, you conceivably could lose on the, uh, in an arbitration where it, where it fought. So they don't have the right to reject it, but if they think that you have violated the relevant clause in the contract, they could then file a grievance and that would go to arbitration and the arbitrators would ultimately have to rule on that. So that's also part of the, part of the equation. So they don't have to vote on the carrier change. We don't have to take it to each union and have the union you know, vote on it. So approval isn't really the right uh, way to describe it. Um, but they have the right to have their uh, collective bargaining uh, agreement enforced. It's a grievance process as opposed to like a, like a contract vote. And when do you think this process is going to be over? Well, I think we'll, uh, we, we need to have another meeting with uh, Anthem because one of the um, uh, ideas that we had after reviewing the bids, and, and the bids took a couple stages. Aon, and Aon did tremendous work on this, I should point out, because sometimes I'm an Aon critic and I want to point out they really did good work on this. They got one set of numbers and then they go back to them and say, okay, now let's get serious. <laughs> Give a set of numbers too. Get us what they call a best and final. Um, and in some cases, the, the, the gap narrowed. <coughs> so now it looks like there's a possibility that it may be, may be uh, uh, some benefit to the board and the town separating on this. And that has some implications for fees and, you know, this sort of thing. So we really need to have another powwow with Aon, uh, who's gone back to the carriers to find out, is this really possible? Because the board and the town have always been together, thinking there was an economy of scale there. Um, so I, I think we're, we're well into next week uh, on this. Uh, and then we have to make an independent decision. You know, we want to be together on this in terms of the, the judgment. So um, this is just taking longer, but it's an important decision. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should rush it. Can I ask one more question related to this, just to my understanding, and, and feel free to correct me as I know you will if I go wrong here, but when we discussed this and you were stepping me through this, uh, Mr. Mayor, one of the items that you had indicated, I'll use my own language, when, and Dr. Tyler, your opinion is welcome here too, was that that change in car uh, carrier and the impact that that might have on expenses was the quote unquote squishiest number that you could get because it was entirely based on assumptions because in changing characters, carriers and characters, you would be changing uh, networks. And so there was all sorts of assumptions built in on the experience side by the new carriers as to, well, if your employee base had this behavior, right? They went to this set of doctors that's within our network, which is the same percentage as they went in the Anthem network or a different percentage based on this, yada, yada, yada. This is what your experience would be. So it was where that risk really is minimized on the Anthem side because we have that claims experience and we know pretty much precisely where these people are going. Whereas if you change it, their behavior has to change based on the network, et cetera. Am I explaining that well enough? Yeah. Uh, the, only, the only couple of, the only real exception, you said the squishiest set of numbers. It is the squishy number. The other numbers right. are not squishy. Right. But, well, they're but, all but, squishy because they're based on what's going to happen next well, year. Well, yeah, on the claims experience right. side, we're exactly right, you know, yeah. which, goes, which carrier you go to. But the movement of to a different carrier is squishier, yes. Right. staying with the same carrier. Your administrative load, your, uh, which includes your stop loss um, and, and your claims management is, is set. In, is set. Right. Okay. And, um, and we did receive late this afternoon the final numbers from Aon, uh, assuming the town and Board of Ed were to divide. So we're and, and Mr. so with respect with Dr. Title's comments, yes, we do need to meet again. We need to come to some final conclusion. Uh, there would be, if we split, uh, an additional cost to the town from the proposals, but continued savings, limited change to the Board of Ed. Okay. 
and then we have to make a, a, a judgment, uh, excuse me, a, a subjective decision on what percentage of that squishy number we want to and we want to accept. And then we have to uh, also think about the impact of the cost of a change, the, um, the morale on the change, the people's attitude, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's just a couple other things at play here. One is um, the numbers that are being quoted assume that we can make this move for July 1. Um, at this point, as this is taking time to work through, I'm not sure July 1 is realistic. Um, just it takes a long time to switch this over. So um, that's also a question mark. Maybe September 1 might be more realistic. So we're talking about two months of the old. Um, and any um, change you might see in the bid documents. So when the bid comes in and it looks like, say, the Board of Ed, the savings to the Board of Ed would be, say, $500,000. Remember that 20% approximately of that accrues to the employees. We would get 80% of that savings because we up our employees pay about 20% of the premium, so they would share in that. So if you look at a document, it may show X, but remember, that's not the number you could take out of the budget because you would only get 80% of X. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tittle. Is that Does everyone understand what's included now and what's not included in this medical adjustment? So, the, so the bottom line is we these are the best numbers we have right now, but there's a possibility that the RTM, when they get this budget, may be able to make a further reduction depending on what the choices that the administration and the board makes. Is that accurate? I would say yes. And in addition to that, we'll also have March data before we go to the RTM, which could March have, experience, which could have an ex impact one way or the other. The only thing is that the, the, the RTM won't be able to, to raise anything. They can only go in only one direction down. Right. So. But you would hope if the experience goes the wrong way, yeah. but you have the savings here, yeah. then it out. Yeah. That's the part of not having enough in the reserve to start with. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments on this item? Other expense items in this adjustment area. Mr. Mayor, anything else you'd like to point out? Uh, yeah, to? the second largest expense revision is the, in the contingency account, yep. which is reduced by a total of $660,000. This is an adjustment made to um, budget for anticipated employee turnover. Um, this amount is approximately equal to the fiscal year 2012 savings and seems to be a reasonable estimate based upon a review of this year's activities to date. Um, and some of the old timers might remember that when I was on the Board of Finance, this was an adjustment that uh, I requested every year be added to the budget. Um, did not have enough information to, at the initials, when, when we first did the budget, to pick what I thought was a reasonable number for that. Now I think this, this number is a reasonable number. What percentage of it did you take, Bob? Uh, it is about 100. It, like I said, it's, it's uh, no, let me back up. It is oh, thank you. About 76%. So it's not the full churn value, it's 76% of the churn. So we're budgeting churn now is what this is. Yes, sir. Questions? Mr. Walsh. Do you have a calculation on this? Like a f a f how, what your assumptions are and all that other stuff? Yes, sir. Can we get that as well? Sure. Um, also, you just based this on 2012. Have we looked at 2012 and year to date was what and, I just said this year. To date. Uh, this is a new budget item uh, that I've never seen. Does it make any sense to go back further to analyze what it's been over the last number of years? I, I don't really know enough about it, to be quite honest with you. Mary? And I don't know what companies say. do. I mean, Tom, you might have more experience in this. I, I don't really know. To be honest, in tough budget years, we have budgeted charity. <laughs> Um, I guess it's not too much different from the teacher retirements that we right. budget on the Board of Ed side. But I do have a question is that last year in particular we had a lot of retirements from department heads. And are they included in this number? And the new 
Yeah, I don't understand the question. I don't, I don't understand the question fully. Um, well, this is, you mean, from people who are retiring to the difference in salary? Yes. So Based upon an average salary of 50000 bucks per year. So is it including all employees, including department heads? Yes. Just because, I, I, my question is because at the top level are, are department heads, and we had normally don't have so many people retire at that level that we did last year. Right. So you're saying the churn last year may have been greater. Right. I may have been overstated, yeah. Can we just check that? I think it goes to Mr. Walsh's point about checking this calculation since it's a, right. a new item. We want to make sure we're... No. We are, uh, we are actually... We had a long conversation with Jude about that today, trying to get uh, some improved information on this item. This seemed reasonable. All right. Can we get that? And, and can you take another look at it, taking into consideration Mrs. LeClaire's comments? <coughs> Most definitely. It's, on this contingency item, this 500, is it 500? Is it the? 660. 660. The whole thing has to do with this churn. No, there, there's... Um, yeah, there's another $162,000 in that number uh, related to uh, uh, contingency account, uh, other contingency account adjustments. Okay. Um, in this contingency amount for the $500,000 only, uh, does this only apply to churn you see happening in town hall, not on the Board of Education side? Not on the Board of Ed, no. Okay, because they have their own stuff for Correct. the teacher retirements and stuff like that. Correct. And what's the estimate in your calculation regarding how many employees that is? Uh, about 10. About 10. Okay. Do other municipalities ten, that you ten, know of? 10 unfilled positions. Are there other municipalities that take do the yeah, same that thing? That's not right. What? That math doesn't work. It's 50,000 per head. Right, but that assumes everybody resigns on July 1st and you don't fill them for the rest of the year. That doesn't That's work. That's right. It means 10 per head throughout the year. Correct statement. It means 10 vacancies on average throughout the year. Right, which means that the actual vacancies have to be much higher than 10 because you're going to have ins and outs, so you're actually, it's a multiplier. That's what I said, the average of 10. No, you said 10. It's not the average of 10. Well, In order 10. to get the average of 10, how much churn is that, is what I'm asking. I, I'm only talking... Uh, what I'm saying is one of the analyses I did right. was ran the, the payroll reports. How many people were paid each week, each by week, depending on what the payroll was? Adding the total number paid, comparing it to the budgeted total number, budgeted total approved positions, and getting a difference of 10. So essentially you're saying you, to your point, and I just want to make sure this is right, there's resignations would have to be much higher than 10 in or, order for you to always have 10 vacant positions. You're talking on average you've had 10 vacant positions all year long. Correct. 50,000. So that means, and I think that probably goes to your point, how many resignations is that a year mm -hmm. in order to average 10 per month? And it's a multiplied, it, it's a number of resignations, because theoretically you're filling them. I don't know what your average yeah. length of. Yeah, I, 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 that, that's almost, we, we talked about how we can get that information today, but that information not readily available based upon the town systems, Munis or HR. Well, how long so do you, how, you can calculate it. How, how long do positions generally stay open? I don't know. We don't know I cannot give you an accurate vacancy report for any given week of, of really? the year. So you can't go to HR and say, how many positions are you looking to fill? Today's, right? the HR vacancy report today shows 29 vacancies. We do not have 29 vacancies. I'd say that's a problem. Yeah. How many vacancies do you have? I think we have about 10. But the HR report has 29? Yeah. Actually, the difference, the last payroll difference was 19. No, it wasn't it's 19. It's amazing. You talk, it, 60. it comes out of no, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's not right. That's not right. It was, that, that's, that's not a correct number. See, that's how much I have faith in her. I just parrot. Uh, it is uh, total, uh, total positions is 
42, 44, 45? Hmm? 480. We have 11. There were 469 people paid in last year. But yet your period. HR system says you have 29? Yeah, this is a problem. No? I mean, yeah, I no, I, you know, obviously requires some cleanup. What is, or is, I don't know if they're process? behind because someone was on vacation. I have no idea. I have no idea how that process works. They'd have to be on vacation for a long time. Mrs. Fitzgerald? What oh, you have to come up to the top. Judah's is here. If I had known Judah was here, I would have called on her long ago. That's why she was ducking. No, no, I'll try and answer it as intelligently as if possible. If you want to whisper over there, we can get it. No, oh, I, I don't do that. Thank you. Um, we have 467 paid employees, full-time employees. Basically, what happens with the vacancy reports, um, there's what's called a position control is given to every vacancy that we have. Right. What happens is um, HR actually um, produces the position control, which produces the vacancy report. So what happens was we had 29 people, as Bob just alluded to. What happens then at that point, though, if Chris um, at HR or somebody downstairs does not actually take off the position when it's filled, which happened in this case, we just filled two positions. The report now actually reads 26 positions. That's how it comes wrong if they don't actually eliminate the um, position off of there. What happens is when she puts that vacant position into payroll, she actually gives it a new position control number which is kind of a problem so then if she doesn't clean up the report it leaves that position open it looks as if it's an extra vacant position when it's not right so it seems like you'd have to go through the HR system and cross out all the unbudgeted positions correct. that should have been eliminated correct because we just had two today because it was one from the tax collectors that was just filled and um, also from Smith Richardson so that brought it back down to 26 people because I just looked at it before I left work today okay okay Thank you. For the yeah, Jude, can you just introduce yourself for the record so that we have it? I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Jude Fitzgerald. Payroll. Oh, payroll. <laughs> That's on. Thank you. She's just not a member of the audience who knows the payroll files for the town. Let's just make sure. Um, I'll tell you what. I, Budgeting churn doesn't bother me so much, but I'm a little uncomfortable with the number. I mean, I'd love to see the calculation, and I'm only speaking for myself personally. I'm a little concerned. Um, it seems, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but it seems a little high on the average side. And the fact that it's difficult to tie out between the HR system, you know, for the first time out, I'd hate to be materially wrong on this. So if, if you could do a little bit more digging just to get us comfortable, I'm not... Me personally, I'm not opposed to the concept. I just need to understand the number a little bit. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Gerald just indicated, it was the last thing she looked at today when she left the office, because we we were talking about this today, as to how we could refine and improve our information. Yeah. So that's I, a continuing do, effort. Do, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do others feel the same way on that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions on this item? Mr. Brockfeld. No, I actually want to go backwards, if I could, to so if everybody's finished with this. Is everybody's finished with this? Feel uh, free. I've got more questions on this specific item. Go oh, all right. Then you go, Jim, and then we'll go okay. to Ken. So when you did the calculations for 2012, there was a $50,000 difference between someone who leaves and then someone who takes over that same position? No. How, do you, how are you figuring out the difference, the $50,000 per employee for the 10? What I'm saying, Mr. Walsh, is that at any given point in time, there's an average of 10 people, 10 positions that are not filled. Okay. <coughs> and that over the course of a year, there are 10, uh, 10 52 week periods that are not filled. And then I'm using an average salary of approximately $50,000. 10 times 50 is 500. Well, that brings it back to Mr. Flynn's point that you're assuming that on July 1st, all 10 employees quit and the positions aren't filled then for like the whole year. Yeah, but what he's saying is that it's an average. So, so he's saying that as it churns, it's always 10 that are open. At any given point, there's 10. It might not be the same 10, but there's always 10 vacancies within the 460 employees of the town. So that's what you're saying. Right. Correct. 
and you're using an average salary of 50000 Some months it's going to be higher, some months it's going to be lower. Right. But on average you're saying you're going to have – you're not going to have the full complement of staffing at any given point through the year. All right. It just seems as though if we're going to be going down this road, and this is a, a philosophy we want to use, that for the coming year you should keep track of actuals so we can compare the actuals, the actual dollar saved during that period of time for every single employee who's out to see whether we can get to a budgeted number as opposed to just taking, we're assuming 10. Because there should be a number that we could figure out what, what the savings And 10 been. was calculated based upon the difference between the approved staff by Board of Finance and the RTM compared to the people paid every payroll period. I ran a payroll period. Yeah. Let, let, just, let, put it this way. Maybe this will simplify. Week one, there were 482 approved positions. Only 472 people were paid. Week two, there were 482 approved positions. Only 472 people were paid. Week three, there were 482 positions. Only 472 people were paid. On and on and on. Now, who the people are? What the positions are, I have no idea. I only know the difference in the numbers. But we should be able to calculate, say, coming for the coming year, so that when you come to us for the budget process, where we stand with this $500,000 calculation. Uh, right. As I think I've said, we are working to refine this, to refine the information, to develop the reports, so we have better information going forward. Mr. Salvin? Mr. Mayor, should we be able to see um, in the quarterly reports when we see the expenditure for salary line, we should be able to see through that the comparison then? Because you will have the actual salaries paid to date in the quarterly report. Yeah, the, the, and this you should be able to compare that against uh, your your average of your ten. We should be able to get the numbers in the quarterly report. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult for two reasons. One, this year because of FEMA, uh, and because hours 36 through 40 are overtime hours paid under the regular payroll, and because FEMA this year a lot of hours FEMA hours got. Uh, put in, you know, uh, accrued into the payroll system. And then finally, because we accrue it all, so it takes a little bit of time and effort. But you, the answer is yes. But I'm just saying it's just not straightforward. Okay. I mean, I'm just looking for a way to try to reconcile yeah. I mean, these numbers for yeah. members sitting here. We can move on from this. Okay. Okay. It's just, this is on this topic. Just right? on this. Because I have one as well, Mrs. Mayor. Okay, go ahead. Maybe just for this moment, right, for this budget, we know that there's 10 positions out, we think, around 10. So it shouldn't be hard for human resources to give us the 10 vacant positions. Just, just, just right now, point in time, as of today. Yeah, as Ms. Fitzgerald indicated earlier, that report has... Yeah, but I know, but, but, yeah, yeah. but I know, I know so what the report says, hard, okay? Right. But, there's a report and then there's real life, okay? Right. In real so, life, so, we so should know you have what to positions are You have to massage the report. You have to call up the departments, know who's been hired, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's why I said to Ms. Album, it's the information is all there somewhere. It's just not all reachable at the push of a button. Okay, but it is reachable. So maybe, maybe that can, we can get that. Just to 10 positions. Well, there's one comment on that too, but yeah, okay. Yeah. See, I know it's an average, but let's just just to just because you know Mr. Walsh is asking a lot of questions about this. Let's just see where it plays out right now. Let's just see where we're at right now. Maybe it's eight, maybe it's eleven, but at least we know. Yeah. Theoretically, Ms. Jew's last payroll report was 469. We have 484, so there should no, be. How much is it? 467. 
I'm sorry, 467. We have 482 full-time approved positions. So theoretically, on the date she ran her payroll for that, for that weekly period, okay, so there were can 15, we just get it in writing? There were 15 people who were not paid. All right, but she's not agreeing with you. On the grievance 467, but not the 484. Right. If you improve the budget, I think Linda has it there. It's 486.5 people. You said. Okay. Just, just, just yeah. get in writing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Mrs. Leclerc. Um, I think I might have answered my own question, but I just wanted you to explain the mechanics a little bit of how this works. This is going to be a reduction in contingency. Correct. And this adjustment is the differential between what you're going to hire a new person for and the old no. person? No. Or, no. It's for the time period that the position remains vacant. Okay. It's different than the teacher's reserve or whatever we call that. No. So it's off from then what we told Mrs. Ronald, that if she didn't fill a position, she could possibly hire um, part-time people to fill that position. It, you know, we're, we're now taking that out of her budget. Because some, at some point, we'll have to transfer money from her budget back to contingency. All vac yes, there would be a transfer from vacant, uh, vacant position savings per department to contingency, correct. Okay. So we would have to make those transfers during the year when it... Well, we'd make, we make those every September, I believe. So in actuality, there is, under your methodology, approximately $500,000 in the 13 budget that technically could be used for contingency, even though the RTM cut the contingency, but there would be the, that, 500000 500, still still floating around someplace in our budget. That $500,000 was taken into consideration in the preparation of the variance report that you have. Okay. Does the $500,000 or anywhere near there show up in the CAFR? What the no. actual savings were? No. 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 Will we, at the end of 13, when we close our books out, will we be able to find this amount of money, whatever it actually is? Is there any way to track that? At the end of what the, the year, savings were in 2013 for the open right. positions? The open position savings for the year end, June 30, 2012, was $675,000, I believe. I have, I have two, um, Is that correct? two questions, comments on this, now that I think about it a little bit more. Um, and those would be these, and Mrs. LeClaire touched on it as well. Um, Using 2012-2013 as a baseline in terms of number of open positions for length of time, my only concern is you have to take into consideration that the first selectman asked that positions be held open for a period of time. So if that policy changes, you might have, your, your churn might not be as dramatic. Because Correct. So, so that's one. The second one is, and, and it might just be the way you're, articulating it and it might not be the way you're doing it or it might be the way I'm understanding you. You're basically saying that, hey, I, I know in the budget that I had 467 or 485 approved positions. Basically, I took the budget and said, okay, for all year I have 485 approved positions. And then I said, give me the payroll files for each month. I did the calculation and said, basically, on average, we're down 10 people per month, right? That's right. essentially what it was. So that, to me, intuitively, Sounds right, right? Then I think about it a little bit and I say, the only problem I have with that is in some departments, we actually use this savings here that we have by, by this issue with overtime. Because where you have minimum manpower requirements, you actually. I'm, I'm not addressing, you're absolutely right, but I'm not addressing overtime. I, I understand, but what I'm saying is by not addressing that, you're taking out you're accounting for the upside in the savings, but you're leaving the downside in the overtime cost in the budget, or not in the it's budget. It's in the budget. No, but when we go over on overtime, a lot of times it's because, oh, we, we had three guys out, right? I mean, you right. know that. Yeah, right. Right, so you're saying, okay, I'm not gonna have any savings, so if we have three guys go down, I'm taking the savings here, and the entire hit to overtime, there's nowhere to offset it. Yeah, the, you, I understand exactly what you're saying, 
and, and that would be a nuance, I guess. You, you'd make a decision where you'd want to make that adjustment. <laughs> but you, Do you can't leave, be... leave overtime fully absorbed or reduce the overtime. You're not going to have anything to reduce it by because you're taking the upside. That's here. what I'm saying. You either do it problem. here or there. No, but the problem is you're taking it out of the budget. So that overtime, right, right but, now. But, that, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm showing the overtime gross. Absolutely. But there's nothing to net it. Correct. Right. So it's an exposure in your budget. Over, over, yeah, overtime is. It's an exposure in your right, budget. But, to but, the extent but if, that if you, you, if you If you had the same uh, number of open vacancies and the same amount of overtime and you budgeted the vacancies based upon prior vacancies and overtime based upon prior overtime. That's not the way they do it, though. A lot of times they go over, I mean, every year when they come to us and say, we're over overtime, you say, well, I, you know, I, yeah, right. two guy, you know. I. Right. I mean, the problem is minimum manpower, right? On I the mean, fire that, department, totally. Right. So, I mean, I would say that in order to get this calculated, you'd actually have to exclude the fire department from the, I mean, that's, that's the biggest area. Or not reduce the fire department overtime based from actual. It's already, they go over it every year pretty much anyway. Well, yeah. But, but if you, but, but if you, but if, right, because at the end of the day, this board, the RTM, Board of Selectmen, yeah, reduce, where do we usually reduce get the, the overtime. Wrong. Where do we usually get the money? We haven't reduced it in a couple of years, and we got okay. really upset because when we didn't reduce it, they still went over. They still went over. Right. Didn't we add to it one year? Right. We added to it one year, and they still went <laughs> over. So, so, and every year when we do the adjustments in September, one right. of the adjustments they use to offset it, is it would eliminate. It would, so. it would doing this would eliminate that avenue. Correct statement. Right, and that and that's I'm not I'm not trying to be argumentative. Yeah, no, I know I'm not. Nor am I. I I'm, yeah. I fully understand what you're saying. And I, so maybe yeah. the way to do it is to just, does not do this, or to eliminate the fire department from the analysis <laughs> and just do it apples yeah. to apples without the fire department. Yeah, because that seems to be the biggest area of concern. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. So it's net net. You're saying you think the 500 is too big a number? Well, I haven't seen the calculation, but if the 500 is a gross. Is including based on fire department. including the fire department. Right. I'm concerned because it takes a takes out any cushion we have for that overage right. and overtime that we invariably get because you're right. you, you're assuming that up front. If you did this analysis and excluded mm -hmm. the fire department, no, I understand. so are we are we asking so Mr. Th Mayor this is a cushion eliminator. Right. <laughs> right. So basically, could you do this without with excluding the fire department and see what that ten person thing becomes? You'd hit that first thing in the morning, I guarantee it. Yeah, it's Good Friday. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Monday morning. <laughs> Thank you, Jude. All right, that was a good comeback. Excellent. All right, any other comments? I think we beat this dead horse. I wanted to go back before. Yeah. Okay, does anybody have anything on this, Adam? Seeing none, we'll go back to Thanks. Mr. Brockfield. You know, I want to come bring back something that Mr. Walsh pointed out many minutes ago uh, that all of a sudden concerned me a bit. If we look at this health insurance uh, improvement, right, we have 1.3 million for the Board of Ed and uh, 455 for the town side, right? I'm just focusing on those two uh, related to improved experience. Right? Correct. And is this based on one month's improved experience? You know, remember, because we had this big discussion about how you, you You've had this discussion every meeting, yes. Right, but this is important right now, I think. So is this based on a new month being added and, the, and, then, and then the 13th month being thrown off? No. Th this is the total difference between the initial, well, let me take that back. I know the Aon guys aren't here, so I'm putting you on the spot a bit. But no, 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 no this, is, this is easy. Okay. The Board of Ed initial number was based upon experience through November, right. when the first selectman's budget was completed, mm -hmm. we had experience through December. Okay, it was significantly improved, m uh, moving the b the first selectman to make a 1.1 million dollar reduction in that line item. Right. This number is now based upon information for two additional months, so through February. Okay, so, here, so here's my. So concern. basically, the initial number was for. For this current year, even though it's always a trailing 12 months, that's right. But for this current year, in November we had 
what would that be? June, it would be July, August, September, October, November, five months, now it's eight months. Okay. Here, or 60% yeah, more data. Right. But, okay. So, but I'm focusing now on this 1.3 million number, right? By yes. definition, this came out of an additional two months. Two months, right. So, and that's a big, big number, obviously. I don't know. 33% more data. Yeah, okay, but it's two months. Let's just focus on that. Right. So, and I probably have no problem up to that point, right? It's all perfectly obvious. But what I'm concerned about is what Mr. Walsh pointed out, which is that since these numbers are extremely sensitive to month by month new information, right? I know right. it's two months, but one month obviously can no, also No, totally, absolutely. Right? It's the nature so, of these. So, what I'm saying is that we're putting into the budget these numbers because these are the most recent numbers we have. And then since the, the way our system works in Fairfield, the RTM can only cut, not add, right? So I think Mr. Walsh was getting at, and all of a sudden concerns me, is that if we have our next month's data, which will be available before the RTM votes, correct me if I'm wrong, and if, God forbid, we have a very bad experience in that month, right? Right. Then this number can change dramatically for the worse, and it puts the RTM in a terrible pickle because they can only cut, they can't add back, so they have, to, they have to find a whole different area by which to, to find that money. Well, if, right? well, they can't find the money. What, what, ba basically, I don't mean find it literally. I, what, I, mean, what I, I guess, since they cannot add, right. and I don't want to, I would hope, I don't even know if I should say this, but in other words, if, if someone gives me a budget and they say, but whoa, we just got some new information the real expense is potentially going to be more, that I would think would reduce my enthusiasm for other different cuts. It may, or it may not. Or it but, may not. Right. But, but that's I, I, the I see, Mr. Blee, just hang on. But, but, um. And that's what reserves are for. Okay, well, that, that, that's a partial answer. I mean, I'm just, I guess I mean, basically, let, let's, let's be clear on one thing. I mean, yeah. These are numbers. I'm a fiscal officer. Mm -hmm. I'm providing numbers. You gentlemen are the elected body. It's your responsibility to interpret the numbers. It's my responsibility to give you the best numbers I can, mm -hmm. give you the best interpretation of numbers I can, and then you're elected by the town citizens to make the judgments as to what you want, you know, where you want to no, go. I understand, but what I'm concerned, wow. what I'm becoming, wow, yeah, thank you. Civics thank lesson. you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, okay. no, I mean, I just want to, like, I mean, I'm just, it's, you know, it's all I'm saying. I mean, it's like, these, these numbers, these yeah. numbers are, are very. No, no, I understand, but, but, you know, just, they're, they're fungible and they're variable and. But, but what I'm concerned about is, is, is everything you said is 100% obviously correct, but, yeah. Some numbers are more volatile exactly. in a short period of time than others, right? I mean, yes. most of the numbers in front of us, based on what we've heard from you and based on our trust in your expertise and hard work <coughs> in your department, it, it, we, we feel pretty good that they're not going to change dramatically from now till May, right? But, but there's a very good chance, based on the recent experience that we've been seeing with these insurance numbers, that just one month could, could meaningfully change the, uh, re the, the requirements on the, on the health insurance. And if the RTM had the ability to cut or add, then it really wouldn't be a particularly big problem. Uh, I mean, nobody would like to have to spend more, obviously, but, but since, since they can only cut, I'm just wondering. There is an appeals process, so the department head could appeal it. So if the administration felt that there was new information that imperiled the town right. from a financial perspective, I'm assuming they could actually do that appeal themselves. I think there is an appeal process, well. but I'm not at this point. Appeal no. to who? I know how to the RTM. To the, RTM. the RTM. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't put that as part of the civics yeah. lesson. And I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. That's I'll, chapter I'll up three. That. Oh, We're okay. not there yet. Yeah. 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 Mrs. Alvin, you've yeah. been waiting patiently. So. Um, to Mr. Brackfeld's comments and I think dilemma. Uh, right now we're seeing increased experience of 1.3 million in the Board of Education side in the health insurance. And your concern is what happens if that turns the other way in the March numbers? Right. Yes, the RTM can only reduce the budget, both for the uh, school department and for all town departments. So what I'm hearing you say and the dilemma you're having 
given that we have heard from a lot of members of, of this community and a very vocal subset of the community to reduce tax increase. Certainly we've seen some of their numbers and as much as possible is what I'll say they're telling us. Um, so we can do that. We can add money to this budget or we can, we can get ourselves down to any figure we want on a tax increase. But the RTM can't rectify what we do. So that places a great deal of responsibility on this board when we make the reduction that we try to balance this out for a reasonable tax increase but without going so deep thinking that we might anticipate what would happen next month based on insurance numbers in the opposite direction and that the RTM couldn't rectify what we might do. So we are sitting here in a very difficult place because we're trying to get the numbers down so that taxpayers are pleased, yet if we go so deep and the RTM can't rectify it, we may affect town services negatively. So we have an extremely important decision to weigh next Tuesday. That's what I can tell you you're going to have to struggle with. Thank you, Mrs. Alvin. Did you have a question? Because I thought you did have a question as well. Did, or no? No question. No question? Okay. No, I thought, I thought Mr. Polito had indicated you had a question for Mr. Mayor on a line item. Mr. Brockfeld, are you set? Yeah, it, I mean, I, this is a discussion night, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm set yeah. in the sense that I understand fully what the issues before us are and where the numbers come from. Uh, I'm just, since we are just discussing, I'm just continuing to say that I, I'm, I'm getting a little uncomfortable with this part of the improvement, which of course is better than if it wasn't an improvement, because it's, unlike most of the numbers, this is this number is in fact it's definitely going to change right almost guaranteed March's results will do something to these numbers right it yes. might make them even better than 1.3 million I'm focusing on the Board of Ed for now or it might make it worse than 1.3 million and 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 what I'm always shocked about I guess this is what my concern is and I don't want to make a big deal again about how Aon tells us we should calculate it is that the numbers jump around way too much on a month-to-month -month basis for my comfort uh, and now we're being asked to pass a budget that can only go one direction, although I'm hearing there may be some appeals process, although it sounds like it's pretty complex. So I'm just, anyway, I'm just talking out loud. I'm not sure how to, how to comfortably come up with a number. Yeah, I mean, like basically, and, and I guess I maybe should apologize. I didn't mean to give a civics lesson. So all I was trying to say is I am. Well, it was a good one, though. <laughs> so it was. Thank you. Um, I'm only trying to say that these are the best and their numbers available. There's the latest numbers available. Mm -hmm. And I kind of see you reaching out, Ken, saying, like, help me with these numbers. You're like, what should I do? And, you know, and, and um, you know, it, it's a decision. And what Ms. Album just indicated and what you indicated about, well, then it goes to the RTM and they can't increase it. These are dilemmas that are produced by the process. Yep. But these are the... Let's go to the latest numbers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let's go to Mr. Bolito because I want to try to move this Yeah, absolutely. On. Just one quick comment. I think, Mr. Brockfield, what you've basically done is made the best argument there is for not being self-insured. We're basically put in a position of uh, playing actuaries each and every year of, you know, in the chase to save some money on, on premiums, we have to go through this exercise every year and go through claims experience and go through this agita. Whereas if we were uh, a fully insured program, we'd pay more in terms of a premium to the tune of 5 to 10%, but we'd have cost certainty. We'd plug in a number, boom, we're done. So I, I think that's one of the arguments I've been making for years about investigating not being self-insured anymore. Right. Um, so. the, I guess to Mr. Flynn's point, though, who you've said eloquently repeatedly, the other side of this, though, is that they've, they've told us that, that this was a, a better way to do it financially for the town, but because our reserves are so tight, That's we're exactly playing this correct. game yeah. so tight we're on a razor's that, edge. that we're not allowing ourselves the cushion we need so that we don't have to lose sleep over. I mean, again, I, it's just ludicrous to me that our budget is a major potential impact to our budget because one or two people, God forbid, might get sick in the month of March. Yep. It, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I Just, I, you know. Thanks. I, I do want to move this along oh, because it's a, it's an, we're never going to get as comfortable as you want to be on there. I think Mrs. Alvin summed it up very nicely in terms of what the situation is. One caveat to that, though, 
which Dr. Title and Mr. Mayor spoke to a little bit earlier, is the fact that this year, as compared to other years, we do have that opportunity with the new carriers. So if, in fact, the experience is poor in the next month, right, but they, they elect to go with the new carrier, that is an additional cushion, potentially, against a, a decreased, a, a worsening experience, right? Because there's, theoretically, you'd go to that new carrier and you'd have some type of savings, maybe. Again, it's the squishiest of numbers. Correct. It's there. So. What else? Anything else? That's it on the adjustments. Yeah, I'm going to try to move along quickly here. Um, yeah, good the, luck with that. The, 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 <laughs> The, the third uh, largest expenditure uh, sum is, is the summation of all the uh, adjustments related to the finalization of the actual evaluations of the pension plan and OPEP accounts. They total $271,000. The fourth was the uh, change in the adjustments to the fire department, which is a total of about $221,000 related to the savings resulting from the replacement of the people who retired and some training costs. So those four items total 3.6, so the 3.7 plus. The remaining 150 in adjustments is uh, expenditures uh, identified by department heads as they refine their budgets in response to their uh, uh, the recommendations and requests from the Board of Finance. So in summary, we have a change from 6.38 for primarily uh, the result of updated information an accounting methodology change, favorable health care claims experience, favorable benefit from the RFP process for health care administration, department had revisions. So the total net savings of the items mentioned is 2.2 percent, 2.02 percent, reducing the 6.38 down to 4.36. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions on these? Just one question. On the work attendance bonus, the department heads that's been taken out for 11349 is that based on the fact that there's now going to be a new mid-manager's contract and that's not included in the mid-manager's contract? No. The mid-manager's, there's no changes in for contracts which have not been ratified. Okay. So there could be a contract in negotiation that's just not been ratified. Correct. Correct? Correct. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, seeing none, we're done going through the adjustments. And now it's basically the time where we throw it open and a lot of people ask questions on the budget in its entirety. Some of the department heads are here to answer them. Mr. Mayor is here with his team, as well as if anybody on the board wants to make a brief uh, statement regarding their position on the budget. And no one is compelled to do so. Uh, but this is just our cleanup night. So I throw it open. Anybody? Questions, comments? Questions. Mr. Questions. Brown. I'm sure it's all here in front of me, but on the, um, on the town side, just the town side, and then on the Board of Ed side, as we stand right now, what's the percentage of increase from to 13 or 14, just on the town side? Mr. Brown, do you need percent of expense increase? That's yes. what you're asking for. Okay. That's not expensive. Why don't you guys go ahead and we'll calculate. And then the Board of Ed, too. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Title, do you have that one? I'll tell you that one. Okay. Uh, with those adjustments, uh, it would be 2.7%. Okay. And that includes the adjustments we just talked about? Uh, I mean, including the, the three adjustments, the 1.3, the other, yeah, those three adjustments were at 2.7% uh, year over year operating. Thank you. Okay. Let, well, they're calculating that on the town side, or well, somebody is calculating that on the town side. What other questions do we have, Mr. Walsh? I wasn't here the night of the uh, fire budget, and there's an item here that I've not seen. I guess information on there's a sixty-five thousand for sixty-five thousand dollars under their equipment. Uh, the first selectman has recommended the replacement of a twelve thousand pound capacity hydraulic mobile lift for lifting heavy apparatus. Does the town have any reports or the fire department have any reports to show if that piece of equipment's been certified to show whether it's working? Have there been safety problems with that piece of equipment? I'm trying to figure out whether we can get by with another year on that. So do you have any 
I personally have no idea, but we'll find out. Yeah, if you can go to the fire department and check whether anybody's many maintenance records that show that it's properly working right now, or it's been recertified, or whatever the process they go through with that, or if there's a severe, if there's any type of safety issue with that. Clearly for me, from my standpoint, if there's a, a safety issue where someone's going to be under it and the fire department knows about it, we should know about that. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thanks. Any other questions, comments on any area of the budget? I'm going to open it wide. Mr. Walsh. I had requested information on the split out of the costs to separately to run both the, is this the document? Fairfield Woods. Okay, I'm going to need some time to review this for the next couple of minutes. Sure. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Dr. Title, I had one for you then. I'm the filler. Yeah, no, I just want to. Uh, I'm like the lounge act. Yeah, like the lounge <laughs> act. Yeah, you can you can stay up there. Um, and, and it's not to put you on the on the uh, the spot. You've seen where our board, other town boards, have gotten inundated with emails you know, uh, cut education, cut this, cut that, right? Um, I want to ask your elevator pitch, Ellen. The common perception, rightfully or wrongfully, is that you're overstaffed at the administrative levels, mm -hmm. right? And I just want to basically allow you the opportunity to address that in kind of an open forum. You know, do you I'm assuming based on other comments you made, you don't agree with that. But I, I want you to be able to, to articulate it so that we have Right. Well, I showed you some data when I made the presentation right. about the last 10 years, the administrative staff has basically been flat while the student population and the teacher population has been growing. I can also tell you that when the operational audit came in in 2010, Mrs. Alban was on the board. They actually uh, told us that we were understaffed compared to peer districts and that we should add administrative staff, especially at the central office. Um, at the same time, um, the workload um, currently is extremely high due to the demands of running the school system at a high level. And as I pointed out in the presentation, we have um, requirements coming down the road that are going to require even more administrative work, specifically in teacher and administrator you know, evaluation. Um, we, and even at the school level, I mean, forget central office for the time being, um, you know, there are many districts around here that have assistant principals at elementary schools. We have none of those. I mean, we're running um, 500 student elementary schools with one administrator. Um, that's very lean, and uh, that's going to be difficult to, you know, uh, stay with with this uh, administrative evaluation load. Um, but you know, you're asking the wrong person. I mean, I asked the wrong person, but you know, um, I've seen now what what this uh, what it takes to run this system, what the expectations are here. Um, it's extremely demanding. Uh, we have a uh, uh, clientele that deserves and demands, uh, you know, uh, administrative support when necessary. Um, what does that mean? You said keep. Well, it I mean, every, everybody out. thinks, you know, everybody thinks that you don't need an, you know, an administrator until you have a problem. Okay. Right. Then you want it attention immediately, and you know we uh, we really do our best to uh, you know do customer service for people who've got issues. Uh, most of the time, those issues have to be resolved by uh, by an administrator, um, and you know it's just um, it's very hard, I think, to um, explain to people what um, you know what the value is. I will say that um, we have an improvement plan in place that is necessary to continue um, equity and consistency across the school system. In order for people to have that, um, we need people with the bigger view. That's why you need people who can look at curriculum across the district instead of just looking at it in their own buildings. That's why you need somebody to look at elementary schools as a whole to keep them in alignment. Uh, when we don't have those people in place, things get very fragmented, things get unequal, things get inconsistent, and it's very, uh, it's very problematic. Um, so I, there's just an awful lot that goes into running a complicated school district um, with 1,500 employees. What kind so, of demands currently? I know you're, you're, you've you been talking about these right. mandates that are coming down. Right. What kind of demands do you get currently? What time of 
what amount of time is spent on FOI requests and information sharing. I'm trying to get yeah. to, you said before, well, we've got a demanding clientele. We've got a demand. Right. What does that mean? I mean, right. in layman's terms. Right. I mean, you know. Their the, time doing yeah. It. I mean, you know, FOI requests ebb and flow. Right now we're in a high, high time for that. Uh, we get a lot of FOI requests. We get a lot of requests just for information. They may not be FOI requests. Sometimes they come from town officials. Sometimes they come from the Board of Education. Sometimes they come from, you know, um, just, uh, citizens. It's actually getting to the point where um, some of these um, are taking quite a while to be able to respond to because they're stacking up and we just can't spend all our time doing it. Um, but FOI is a federal, I mean, it's a state requirement. Um, and it can take, you know, hours and hours and hours of staff time to meet uh, what appears on the surface to be a simple FOI request. Um, you get, um, you know, if, if there's a, uh, if people have issues and want to meet with us, uh, issues with the curriculum or issues on different matters, you know, they want someone to meet with them and they don't want to hear, well, I can get, you, I can fit you in in two weeks. Right? I mean, that, that might work somewhere else, but doesn't work here. Um, so there are legal requirements, you know, on the special ed side, we're managing 1,100 individual education plans. Uh, at the end of the day, that, that can be a very uh, legalistic and time-consuming process. Um, you've got to have a strong administrative staff to manage that process, or you expose the district to untold uh, legal expenses and so forth if it's not managed uh, properly. That's administrative uh, work. Um, and look, throughout the year, different things happen. I mean, people were very, uh, you know, impressed with our, uh, you know, fi uh, our, uh, the way we managed our manpower during some of these uh, storms and how we got the schools open. And we deployed all the folks to clean the schools and work with the town to get the schools open for the storm. Well, someone has to tell those people where to go and coordinate it all and make sure you don't have all your people in one place and not in somewhere else. Um, that's what, you know, that's some of what we do. So crisis management comes and goes, you know, as well. Um, so there's just a lot of elements to it. Um, and I think that the, you know, certainly the state mandates are part of it. I think they're continuing to add work to us, but um, just the day-to-day -day operation of the school system as it's currently uh, standing, I think we're properly staffed um, in terms of administrators um, and uh, that it's uh, it's a good value uh, to the community. What do you? What are the new mandates? We've heard about these new mandates right. coming down. What are those? I, I, again, right. Ten yeah. second sound bite. Yeah, the, ba the biggest one. Yeah, that was a long elevator ride. On, right. know, on, on that one, that was all the way to the top of the Empire, that was the State, Empire building. State Building. Right. Uh, the biggest. The, the two biggest ones are um, the rec the new core requirements on the teacher evaluation plan, which mandates more conferences with teachers, more observation, uh, pre and post conferences, observation, setting of goals, the time commitment on that, uh, the estimates are off the charts on what that's, that's going to do. So that's one big one. And the other is uh, all the implications of switching over to what's called the Common Core uh, State Standards. This involves uh, reworking our curriculum, our instructional methods, our uh, entire assessment system to prepare for the new state assessments that are coming out in 2015. So those are the two biggest ones. And there's an overlap, you know, there. Uh, so those are the two biggest new ones that are right now right in front of us. And I have no new bodies in place for next year to, to help with that. Mrs. Albert. Dr. Title touched on something that made me remember um, some history that few people in this room <coughs> and at this meeting will recall. Uh, in the early 1990s when Fairfield was feeling the budget pain and made reductions to budgets, departments townwide, one of them of, of course was the school department. And um, Dr. Harrington was the superintendent at the time and she uh, removed all top administrators that did curriculum work across the district. And this probably dates back to probably 90, 1992. The result of that was that in the mid-1990s, only a couple years after that, we had parents coming to the then board, which I was not a member of, 
and they were concerned because math was being taught not just differently from elementary school to elementary school or high school to high school. There was one high school, but in the high school, or at middle school to middle school. It was actually being taught differently classroom to classroom. Um, language arts was being taught differently classroom to classroom. There were students that were being taught to read in, in the critical primary years differently classroom to classroom. And subsequent, it took quite a few years into the early 2000s to return those people to their staff positions, to start writing curriculum, and to start unifying the curriculum, not just in a building, but or not just in the district, but in a building, in a grade. So, um, and I'm not here to sell this. I, I, I was on the Board of Education. I'm just bringing you some history. Um, but depending upon the kinds of reductions that we make in these budget lines, and it's going to be true on the town side, we can get ourselves down to a minimal tax increase. But it will come with a price. And um, so we are going to have some tough decisions, and I'll keep saying that, because I'm, I have a whole list already, and I'll be revising the list based on revised numbers that we'll be seeing Monday. This is, this is fluid until the moment we vote. But so I, I, I'm not advertising for the Board of Education, but that is history. When we didn't have the people in those positions, we had an inferior instructional program. Thank you, Mrs. Alvin. And thanks for that history. I was hoping you would comment, actually. Mr. Bolito. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, I remember a lot of what Mrs. Alvin's talking about. Um, and that brings me to something that you mentioned, Dr. Title, about the state mandates. You talked about the, the new core that the state is coming down with. Am I to understand that basically every town throughout the state is going to have a, a core curriculum that's mandated by the state? Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, the, th that will be the outcome of it. Okay. Uh, the, the Common Core state standards are not a curriculum per se. Okay. Um, each town has to go through the Common Core state standards and write a curriculum from that. Uh, breaking that down grade by grade, what you should know and be able to do. Um, and we'll have to develop an assessment protocol uh, that mirrors that. So um, it, it's, um, it's similar to the fact that the state now has standards in different subject areas. Um, but this, the big difference with this one, one of the big differences is that this is really national, as opposed to the state of Connecticut. They're trying to drive this down so that it's not just Connecticut having a similar curriculum. You're talking about 45 states having a similar curriculum. Um, and the other thing they're doing is changing the whole way kids are assessed. Right. What the expectations are of that curriculum, what kids can do with it, is being ratcheted up two and three times. And in states where they've sort of just given these tests out without making these changes, test scores have absolutely plummeted. Mm -hmm. So we have got a major work ahead of us in revising curriculum, revising assessments, and working with teachers on their professional development so that they can deliver the curriculum effectively. And this is going on in every right. town. But yes. So if you understand that in the immediate future, obviously you're going to need all hands on deck to get you on board with what the state's doing and what's going on nationally. But looking several years down the line, if you have a set of standards that all curriculums are being based on, wouldn't that obviate the need for having a lot of uh, curriculum leaders? Well, if, if they were finished, um, mm -hmm. they've only done the Common Core State Standards in, in language arts and in math. Science is coming around the corner. Um, and this work is continuous work. Um, it's not like you get it all done in a year, and then you just let it go for six years. Right. There's on, it's really, we have a continuous improvement model. Um, we need to continue updating our teachers' um, skills. We have to continually uh, update our resources that people use to deliver the curriculum. Um, so there's, uh, there's a big rush now, um, but there's continuous work uh, along this line down, down the road. Um, to have uh, the curriculum leadership that we have, uh, and I put some information on the website about this, um, on the Board of Ed website, um, some of what Mrs. Alvin talked about is reflected in the 1999 NEASC evaluation of the high schools, which talked about basically what a 
disaster things were when we didn't have this leadership. Um, it's really critical to keep people on the straight and narrow and keep <coughs> things consistent because as soon as those folks aren't there, as soon as no one's minding the store, people just veer off on their own direction. Um, so we're, we're really trying to narrow the variance from classroom to classroom, um, not make everyone identical. And, and that work will never, will never stop. No. Can I ask, uh, does any other, are there any other questions? I have one more if I can. I'm going to put somebody else on the spot with, oh. your, with your okay. No, with you there too. Oh, okay. I see one of our uh, headmasters of the high school is here, and I've got a question regarding, uh, and it'd be good because you're actually new to the high school, so you're, you're living this now. Right. Um, this gets, this, I'm getting you back for when you were the principal at Fairfield Woods. Um, Thank you, Mr. Flynn. <laughs> so, Thank you. Yeah. So. <laughs> You know, I, and again, this isn't me. I'm just, I, I'm, this is what I hear all the time. Talk to me about the house system. Like, why, hey, why is, oh, this is Mr. Hassett. He's the uh, principal at, at Fairfield Ludlow High School. That's so, correct. That's right. I, I tease him and say every time he goes to a new high school, he asks for more money for an addition. So <laughs> every time he moves to a school, I told him his next job had to be in Shelton. <laughs> um, but Mr. Hassett, in all seriousness, um, Talk to us, what is it, you're the principal of the high school, right? Um, and my apologies for putting you on the spot. But what, you know, geez, do we need these houses? What do these house systems do? What does a house master do? How does that work? I mean, you know, this is all, this is just overhead. What does that do? What does that do on a day-to-day -day basis? Right, well, first of all, in terms of the role of the house master, um, they serve, if you will, as sort of principal of a third of the school. And we, Which is how we, many students? Um, well, we're, we're at about, it's almost 400, you know, um, with, well, actually, with, yeah, about 500 per house. So um, we are, uh, and they serve, you know, as, as a, kind of the, the administrator of that third of the school. Um, each house also, you know, has a dean and a, and a set of counselors. And the theory of the house system, when it originated, you know, going back, you know, 40 years, you know, if not more, um, was the idea of kind of creating a smaller, a sense of community within a building, um, almost a school within a school, if you will. Now, the way that our students are scheduled in, in how it's evolved in Fairfield, um, you know, the original, the original design was that the students would stay within that house and take all of their courses within that house. What became evident was that, you know, with you know, courses like AP courses where you, you know, you may only have one, one or two, one or two sections of a particular course. Um, it, you know, you didn't want to run three AP courses and only have a few kids in each. But as, as the system, uh, system evolved in Fairfield, kids take courses throughout all the houses. But it becomes an important organizational system so that you have, you know, a set of eyes on a smaller, you know, number of children. And, um, and that way, you know, you can, you know, kind of keep as best possible, keep from kids slipping through the cracks, um, you know, be on top of struggling students. Um, and, and each housemaster also serves as, as the main supervisors for the teachers um, who might be organized, you know, by department, you know, in, in a high school. So, you know, one housemaster might be the supervisor for all the math teachers and all the science teachers or all the language arts teachers and all the, you know, social studies teachers or something like that. Um, How many teachers does a housemaster oversee then? We have about 140 staff, 140 teachers, so, you know, divided by three. Okay, and what about, what does the dean do for each of the houses? The dean maintains um, all the attendance records um, for the students. So um, we have a, you know, we obviously have a, a very good attendance record here in Fairfield, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's things in place to make sure that students are attending classes. If they, you know, if they're, you know, they, they maintain the records if students are tardy or cut classes and whatnot, um, because we have a policy right now where, you know, attendance is tied to credit. So, you know, if you, if you do not have a certain, you know, if you have a certain number of, of absences from a class, um, you know, that, that may affect whether you get credit for that. But they also attend to all the discipline, um, you know, if there's, uh, you know, infraction of the school, the school code of law, then, uh, you know, the dean will deal with, with those issues as well. Well, yeah. Deans are not administrators. Right. Okay, what are they? They're in the teacher bargaining unit. Okay. Right. They're paid at a teacher rate. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you for the clarification. Mr. Stone. If this budget gets cut, um, would you consider changing the House structure from three to two? Uh, I'll answer that. I wouldn't. I think our, our high schools are very large and, um, uh, and, and they're growing. Um, and that would, um, I, I don't think that would be uh, a good idea. Um, we have, um, you know, 500, about 500 in a house. Um, I don't think, I think if you went to two houses, then you might as well just obliterate the whole thing. Um, and really, the house system itself um, doesn't cause your cost to go up. It's the number of people you employ. So basically, um, you know, each house has, <coughs> say, uh, this doesn't divide real well, but each house has three guidance counselors right now. So we have a total of nine guidance counselors in each, in each high school. It's like, right, if you went to two houses, but you kept your nine guidance counselors, you haven't saved anything, right? So the way you would save is you've reduced the number of guidance counselors, which you could do that whether you have three houses or whether you have two. So it's really about um, service delivery. You know, if, if you have, um, you know, if, if, you, if you keep um, the same number of people employed, but just divide them among two houses, you don't save any money. And the number of people we have for the number of kids we have is, I think, the right, the right mix. Um, so I, I don't think that um, going from three houses to two is a wise uh, educational move. What was the population of the houses before the, in, in, when we had one high school? How many houses do we have? There were three at the time as well. Was, three? Yeah, yeah. There was, I think there was a time where there were four as well. Yeah. 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 But how many students were there per yeah. house? At that time, no. I, it's probably an unfair question because yeah, neither of you, we, Mrs. Alban, might have been there. Mrs. Right. We probably reached a point. Well, first of all, there were. Um, you would have to consider what the contra contractual um, contractual limitations would have been placed on the teacher load. The houses could have been larger. I would say. Uh, in 2005, when was the last year of a single high school, mm -hmm. and and I know that I'm going back to the numbers because I had a relative at the high school, um, and that was a graduating class of 500 and change. So, and the school had at that time. Actually, you'd have to go back a couple years before that, before they had opened the second high school and started to populate it. So you'd have to go back to about 2003 when the population was over 2,000 and divide it by three. Because you, you had three houses that three year houses. in 2003. So now we have six houses. For how many students? It's but we have right. almost 3,000 students. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and growing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on these items? Board I'll, stuff? On the board, uh, sure. Well, we have. Oh. Sir Hazis, <laughs> thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I appreciated. Okay. I availed myself of you being here, so no thank you thank very much. So it's coming. <laughs> right. Thank. You. Any other questions on the board of ed? Yeah, Mrs. Albin, Mr. Walsh, did you have anything on the board of ed? Okay. Pick. Uh, Dr. Title, picking up where Mr. Stone left off, um, let's assume you don't have a house system at all. One doesn't exist. And how many administrative or leadership positions, because deans are leaders but not administrators, how many positions do you think you would need in each of your two high schools to manage the student body from the b b uh, from positioning them after the headmaster? I don't think it would change. And so I've added up nine counselors, three headmasters, three deans, and I don't know how many secretaries. Not three headmasters. I'm sorry. Um, 
No, three housemasters. I'm sorry. Housemasters, right. Housemasters, nine counselors. Right. I don't know how many secretaries you have, and three deans. And that's in each building. Correct. Multiply it by two. Um, okay, so you feel you would need the same yes. number. You could call them something else. Yeah, I mean, it would, people would go by different names. I mean, typically, um, in a traditional high school model, you have a principal and you have assistant principals. You know, so here we have headmaster and housemasters. Um, but for the schools our size, that's the right ratio. I mean, look, guidance counselors is just a matter of the, you know, service level you can provide based on the ratio. And that's independent of the house system. So um, you've got, you know, 1,500 kids and nine counselors. Uh, whether they're in houses or not, that's a certain ratio. If you do with fewer guidance counselors, I mean, the school will operate, but you're going to reduce your services. Um, I don't think that's a wise, you know, investment. Uh, you know, we confronted this two years ago. Uh, the year I got here, we had a large budget cut. We cut lots and lots of positions out, 40 or 50 positions. Uh, at that point, I, we did not touch the house system. So we've got, you know, maybe other things we have to cut if we have to cut, but I wouldn't touch the house structure. That would not be my recommendation. Uh, it's also been here for, I think it's been here for like 60 years. I don't think I want to be the superintendent that unwinds it. <laughs> Mr. Brockfeld, if, Mrs. Albin, you're done. Yeah, just, to, just to follow up, could you tell us, you've described to us what the house masters do, what the dean does. Yeah. Could you just tell us a little about what the guidance, are they, are they college advisors? What are the guidance counselors that's doing? That's part of their job. Okay. You know, certainly that's part of their job. Um, but guidance counselors have a large range of, you know, functions. I mean, um, Thank you. it could be, uh, you know, working with students who are struggling in classes and being the intermediary between a student and a teacher. Um, you know, obviously they also, they write, you know, college recommendations or recommendations for other programs. They help kids determine what courses they should take with, you know, in, in you know, for the next year. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, a, certainly there, there are people that if students are having issues of any kind, they, you know, that they have an adult that, that knows them reasonably well. Um, those are just a few things, but I see Greg came back, so I'll let him pick up the ball from there because um, I'm sure they do a lot more than I just uh, suggested. Those are some of the big buckets that I'm aware of. He, he's here to save the boss. That's what he's here no, not at all, okay. just to, to augment. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, if, you, if you look at the um, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, you know, the counselors kind of operate under a, uh, you know, a delivery model you know, for each of those grade levels because there's different needs you know, from a freshman to, to senior year. Um, obviously, the, a majority of that work is, is placed in the junior and senior years because of the college process. And that is um, you know, anything from giving you know, advice about particular colleges to writing recommendations to work, helping students um, craft a, you know, you know, a, a, a curriculum vitae, if you will, of, of you know, what, you know, how they want to present themselves to college. Um, you know, and then actually counseling them through decisions that, you know, when it comes to, you know, okay, I got accepted to these schools, these, you know, what are my best options, and, you know, so, so there's, there's a lot of work in that regard. Freshman, sophomore year, um, you know, they're, they're dealing a lot with transition issues, you know, um, you know, struggling with, uh, you know, the rigor that, that kids face when they get to the high school level. You know, when, when you're in middle school and you, you get a lot of A's and B's and you get your first C in high school, you know, because, you know, things have been ramped up a little bit more, you know, how do you cope with that, you know, and, and, and working. And they work with teachers a lot, too, in terms of, you know, help me understand what's going on for the student in your classroom. And, and they serve, and probably the most important function is they serve as the liaison, the primary liaison between the parents and the school. Um, oftentimes, the counselor becomes really the first point of contact for a parent. So it helps a parent understand, you know, what's going on in the classroom, helps them understand, you know, processes within the school. And, um, and you know, that's probably one of the most vital roles that I think helps our community tremendously. Let me, can I follow? Let me ask you this. Actually, you know, you guys come up here and you expect to be beaten up about cuts and so forth. This is an area where actually I, I, I have an opposite <laughs> view personally. How is it possible that at a town like this where I imagine, I don't remember, I know you gave the statistics in the presentation, but a very high percentage of the kids go off to college. Um, you're saying that a guidance counselor has give or take 200 kids 
175 kids that they're supposed to be managing, yeah. so to speak? Just a little lower, I think, about 170. Now. Yeah, my math is as good as I used to be. <laughs> so how, how is it possible? I mean, isn't that an area? I mean, in other words, I'm not telling – I have always said I don't want to even begin to micromanage your budget. It's not our authority or even expertise. But oh, come on. Oh, really, yeah. actually. But, um, <laughs> but uh, is, is that an area that we're properly staffed? And I mean, are, are, is it, I mean, I can't imagine taking care of 170 kids and knowing their needs and their concerns and their Right. It's a big job. Um, you could do a better job if the ratio were, were better, but, in, you know, in an era of scarce resources, that's, you know, but, but I'm get, I guess what I'm with. getting at is because it's unrealistic to expect more funding, right? Correct. I, 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 and, we, <laughs> and, we get, and we get a lot of commentary. I think Tom tried to bring it up because our job here is to, to some extent, channel the community's concerns. And, and we get a lot of questions about administration. Probably, you know, people don't fully understand what, what they're, they're doing. But is it possible we're top heavy in one area of administration and maybe not staffed enough in, in this area? I mean, is the ratios proper? Well, guidance counselors aren't administrators. Are what? They're not administrators. Okay. Okay. So they have, they're not in the administrative just discussion. You know, just, just interrupt right. your title. I think yeah. what happens at the table here yeah. is that we're not as hung up on this, this administrator versus teacher thing. We, right. At least I think of people either being in the classroom teaching Spanish or French or Chinese or, right. or chemistry and then doing administrative work, which whether or not it's that, right. that's their contract. So, so I think of a guidance counselor as an administrator. Well, I, yeah, I, I, think, I that, think the general public, to your point, yes. I think when you go out and you have these conversations, right. which, which spurred me right. do, asking these right. questions, right. the first thing they go to is, oh, you've got so many deans, you've got so many house masters, right. you've got so many right. guidance counselors, you've right. got this. And that's what, so I think you're absolutely right. right. It, whether it, you're hung up on whether what bargaining right. unit. Yeah, the, the, common, the commonality is um, in some way, shape, or form, we all, whether administrators or uh, guidance counselors or secretaries or whatever, you know, we're the support team basically for the teachers in the classroom. You know, it's like the people when, you know, when they stand up to get the Academy Award and they say, you know, I'd like to thank these people and these people and these people who work behind the scenes that nobody's heard of. You know, you know for that teacher to teach effectively in the classroom, you know, they need strong, you know, administrative support. They need guidance counselors who are working with those students in another venue to help them be successful. They might need a, a tutor or a paraprofessional. Um, they might need, a, you know, a housemaster that's working with them on certain issues. Um, you know, that somebody to make sure that there's enough books in the classroom, somebody to make sure there's a lot of support. You know, our job, I've said our staff in the central office, you know, our job in the central office is to support the schools, not the other way around. And that's how I see ourselves. You know, we're there to ensure that people like Greg can do their jobs um, out in the field. And if we don't do a good job with that, then they won't be able to do it very well. So I think there is a similarity in that regard. They're not in a classroom directly working to teach students. Um, although guidance counselors, I would say, do teach. Um, they just don't teach in a traditional, you know, classroom setting. They might teach in a small group or a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I understand how people, anybody who's not directly standing up in front of a group of kids, there's always sort of this, you know, what value are they really, did, you did know, the adding? Did the operational audit address our guidance counselor ratios in any way? Because uh, you're saying that they talked about not having enough. They didn't say we had an understaffing of guidance counselors. Um, our ratio, while it appears high on the surface, is actually reasonable compared to our peers. Um, and that if anybody thought we might have, you know, a few, you know, maybe one or two too many, that we would certainly grow into it as the enrollment, you know, continues to, to go up over the next three to four uh, years. Um, so they, they do have a heavy caseload. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I agree with that. Can I just add? Yeah. Um, you know, and what I would add is that, um, you know, as you, as you all know, um, in terms of the education of a student, it goes so much more now beyond you know, whether you can conjugate a verb in French and, you know, do you know, you know, when the War of 1812 was <laughs> or something like that. I mean, we have seen, and I could say, and I've been in this district for 10 years now, um, and, I, and I know this is true with my colleagues, you know, um, in other towns, a, a massive uptick in what I would characterize as social and emotional um, concerns and issues that students have to deal with. I mean, whether you talk about bullying, whether you talk about school climate, whether you talk about, you know, the internet, Facebook, um, whether you just talk about anxiety in general, um, the pressure of colleges. I mean, it's exponential 
compared to what a lot of us went through when we went through high school. Um, it's just what students have to face. And, and that's, that's not the teacher's necessarily their expertise. I mean, they go to school to, to learn how to teach, you know, how to teach their content areas. But then, you know, folks like psychologists and social workers, I mean, you asked about being understaffed. You know, th in this particular area where the counselors also come into to play, um, along with those other support staff, is helping those kids, helping all of our children deal with all of these things that they are facing that go beyond just, you know, the three W's and you know whatever else you know in terms of content so um, so th we are facing huge challenges in those areas every day so dr. title um, so so while we don't have any say here properly I guess in terms of, of telling you how to manage the actual you know uh, changes that may or may not come from the budgets you've talked about not wanting to not being willing to change the house system that we've had for 50 odd years and so and the uh, administrative staff right uh, that you have currently at the central office and whatever it, administrators are in the school buildings I guess you're one of them correct but um, guidance counselors would that be a an area of, of potential service cut or or do you consider that to be almost sacrosanct at three three per house it's not where I would go um, when we had the large budget cut two years ago we did cut positions at all levels of the organization. It wasn't like the high schools were untouched. Um, it wasn't like, um, so I don't want to portray that, you know, in a budget cutting scenario, the high schools are exempt, because they're not exempt. And last time they weren't exempt. In fact, one of the cuts at the high school still bothers you, right? <laughs> so we made cuts at the high school. We, we cut in a lot of different ways. We cut some, uh, we cut some paraprofessionals, we cut some secretaries, we cut some uh, uh, teachers, I mean, we, we did make cuts. I mean, so it's not that you couldn't cut at the high school. Um, they would have to share whatever burden there is, but um, you don't have to make a giant structural change like obliterating the house system to make reductions. Um, I, you know, we looked at it uh, two years ago with the house masters at the time and Mr. Coyne and and Dr. Real, you know, we needed to get a certain amount of cuts, and uh, you know, guidance counselors, uh, you know, didn't make the didn't make the list. It's not something I would entertain <coughs> at this point. Um, so I wouldn't be looking to make a reduction there. Uh, but it you, doesn't Dad. mean the high schools are off the hook. If I continue just a little bit, Tom. I apologize. I know it's late, but could, I apologize. But because <laughs> this concerns me, you know, you know, one of the things that you, I've had a bit of a sea change in the last few days, but you know, we've talked at this board a lot and in, in RTM and so forth about the, you know, the community's overwhelming, uh, uh, you know, concerns about expenses. But I have to tell you that I've received just as many emails, I have encountered them exactly, that are urging us not to touch the education budget. I think it's fair to point that out as well. It's not a one-sided story in this town. There is a lot of people who want us to pay strict attention to the tax increase and a lot of people who are saying that uh, for the long-term health of the town and the kids and, 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 and in their opinion their house values are tied to the quality of the schools. So I, I'm not really tipping my cap at this point as to where I'm going with it but I, I am trying to get to a little more understanding of where, where the pain will be. So you know I, I hear you slowly but surely ticking off the things that that wouldn't be uh, touched and I respect that. I, I wanted to bring up a question that I've heard also brought up to me by many people is this whole pay-to-play issue, right, that, that that's an option. And I was wondering, has anybody done any calculations based on what other towns charge, how much money we might raise by, by instituting some, some form of pay to play for athletics and some of the extracurricular activities that we provide? Uh, we went through that exercise two years ago um, because people wanted us to look at it then. Um, we estimated then that the, um, uh, the revenue that would generate uh, would be about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars based on a tiered system uh, at the time uh, board directed me to they didn't want to go there philosophically and to find reductions in other areas to meet that um, and so we did I don't know you know again uh, I don't get the final say on the cuts um, I can recommend certain things and the board can do what it wants with them um, look the only the only sure way 
um, for you to guarantee that nothing that you find of value is cut, the only way to make sure that doesn't happen is to not cut the budget. <laughs> Otherwise, there's a risk. Right? And so what you think might need to go or could go and wouldn't do any damage may not be the thing that goes. So, and that's maybe not realistic, but um, because you don't have the line item control, you know, on the town side, you have a little more play, right? You, you don't want something, you just go in and take it. Um, and here we have this bifurcated system. Um, but, I, you know, I, I will say, and I, I don't make threats. I don't put things out there that, oh, this will go if you cut the budget to try to rally people or anything like that. I've never done that. Didn't do it last time, won't do it. Um, but um, I think that, you know, that pay to play has been costed out. Uh, whether that's something that gets enacted, there's downsides to that too. Not, you know, maybe non financial. Um, but um, that's been costed out, so that's your answer. Okay, well, thanks. And I, I, yep. I really do appreciate your candor. I think yep. you've answered every question in right. the best of your ability, so I, I really do appreciate it. All right, thank you for that. Any other questions? To follow up on Mr. Brockfeld's question, when you costed that out at $250,000, was that a pay-to-play, meaning pay-to-play sports, or was that a pay-to-participate, meaning that it include all extracurricular activities? It was so just sports, and it was just at the high school level. And that, is that something you would support, that only people who play sports would have to uh, pay, or, or are you more of a person that's a pay-to-participate person, where we, it's like we if actually, you're into drama or whatever club it, you're into, because not every kid's into sports. Correct. There's, um, we actually called it pay-to-participate because – we don't want parents thinking that if I pay this, my kid definitely plays. Yeah. We already have d arguments with, and this is actually something that's an adverse impact of this. Uh, then I'll get to your other point. Sure. Um, that when people are paying money, then there's a heightened expectation that, look, I don't want to pay this to have my kid ride the pine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we already have conflict about, you know, people, parents or kids who think they should be playing more than the coach thinks they should, and, mm -hmm. and this would ex exacerbate that. Um, Districts that have tried the um, participation fee in athletics have found that while there's some drop off in participation, it's not catastrophic. That kids will generally stay with it. There are kids who will drop out because they can't afford it or their parents <coughs> choose not to pay it. Districts that have implemented it across the board in other areas, um, drama and, and this sort of thing, uh, find huge drop offs in participation. People will just not do it. That's number one. But if you wanted to do it eventually, um, I suggested at the time that you start with sports and you get that down, because that's actually uh, get a better track record. And then at some point, if you want to add it to other activities, you know, you'd have the structure in place to do it. <coughs> um, there's also a lot of sort of hybrid activities that don't fit neatly into the category. So something like you know, performing in the orchestra, while there's a lot of extracurricular with that, it's also sort of a course you take. It's sort of during the day and in, at night. Do you charge for that? There's a lot of gray areas in, in some of these uh, things. But uh, the experience is huge drop-off in participation, and we really don't want to have a huge drop-off in participation. We need things for our kids to do after, after school. And, you know, if this means that, you know, 30 kids who would be on – a certain activity now decide they don't want to do it. I think that's a that's a, that's a loss we shouldn't go with. So those are some of my thoughts on it. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. This is, uh, perhaps seem like a, a a funny place to go to, but I'm just going to make one comment as we all think, and as the Board of Education will have to think when they get a final number. Um, and, and this largely goes out to the Board of Education. They may decide to charge students to participate in drama and athletics, and that may be one of the things they take as a step this year to fill the hole in their budget once they have their appropriation. But we might all want to think about the inconsistency in that as I looked through a lot of the documentation we've received. And we have season pass fees for the Smith Richardson golf course. And if you're a resident of Fairfield and an adult, you can buy that ticket for $360. And if you are a senior citizen non-resident adult, oh, you'd be an adult if you're a senior citizen, um, you can buy the ticket for $250. So we in this town would subsidize 
um, non-residents to use our golf course with a season pass and then we would charge our students a fee to participate in uh, sports and drama. Just something that maybe the Board of Education will want to think about and maybe someone on Parks and Rec will want to review their fee structure. Thank you. I should point out that there's a bill pending before the legislature that would severely restrict the Boards of Education ability to charge for sports and other ac activities. And whether that passes or not, I don't know. But if we're counting on that and then the legislature enacts that, we're in big trouble. Just saw that today. So there's a lot of pushback out there on this. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I want to wrap this up. I do want to thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I, I appreciate yep. it. And this was just a discussion, obviously. We, we do not get any vote on your... Um, on how you spend the funds and how the Board of Education spends the fund. But I do think as you hear things, we always try to combat management by rumor. And, and we do like to get these discussions out in the open so that we have a more well-educated public. And they can feel free to agree or disagree with what you said, but it's important that we have these discussions. So thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Hess. All right. Uh, we were waiting on a growth percentage on the town side. Do we have that? Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, you might use this style. Let me give you more than one number. Uh, eight numbers. <clears throat> the total is 5.9%. That 5.9% is made up of the following. Workers' comp, 0.3%. Pension, 2.5%. Debt, 1.4%. Paving, 0.8%. The contingency makeup 1.0 percent supplemental contribution to risk management negative 1.6 percent operations 1.5 percent for again a total of 5.9 so the drivers there as we know are are the pension and contingency and what was the third largest one i can't remember 1.4 Debt. Debt and paving. Well, and then operations is there as well at 1.5. Okay. Yeah. Could you email that to us, please, Bob? Certainly will. Thank you. Any other questions from board members on the entirety of the budget? If this is going to go on much longer, I am going to call for a break, uh, but let us know. So if anybody's got a plethora of questions. No. no? I have questions you are in the library. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question regarding the, uh, the library handout that was handed out tonight. Uh, I'm the one who requested uh, the, what the breakout of, actually, this doesn't meet the requirements of really what I requested. I didn't ask solely for Fairfield Woods Library. I wanted the breakout of what each library cost first. Secondly, I'd asked for it based on the 2014 budget. And I thought I was kind of clear about that. So I'm not sure why I'm getting the 2013 budget numbers in here. Um, who prepared this? Who, who, how, how was this prepared? Uh, th this was prepared uh, with uh, Karen Ronald and uh, uh, Connie uh, Nolfi. Okay. Um, well, I'd asked for it on the, t the, the current budget that's before us, so that doesn't meet it. The other, the other when, I, when I go through the numbers, what stands out to me sometimes is, is when you put certain assumptions on things, it's funny how you get the exact same number you want to get to. And the assumption seems to be on more than a dozen of these matters, uh, these expense items, is that there's a 25% breakdown. You assign 25% of the costs as a, just a, a number. There's no breakdown. I get, I, I'm not sure whether this was... Uh, Linda, when you were do, or Bob, when you guys were doing the budget, did you assign 25% of these costs to Fairfield Woods Library? Uh, we don't break the numbers out like that in the budget, as you're aware. Okay. Because I'm not really, you know, if you start assigning 25% of these costs to each one, and you know, some of the costs yeah, are they're 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 interesting. Are, the well, Bob, I'm not done with my question. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, you know, some things like the maintenance cost. It would appear to me that the maintenance cost of the Fairfield Woods Library, even though it's smaller, would be a lot more than a new building. Um, but yet, we're just assigning 25%. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of 
clear math that goes into this or these assumptions. It just seems to be 25 percent. So I'm not really surprised at the end that the number or the cost for Fairfield Woods is basically 26 percent of the total cost. If you go down the list, yeah. say start with the one or second, third, fourth number, estimate 25 percent of approved library budget. Um, wherever you see those exact words, yes. Those were areas where um, the library staff didn't allocate any numbers. Uh, the average, uh, when we, you know, the total average is approximately 25 percent. So just to fill something in, they were used as 25 percent. The other numbers, like the 524,787, uh, the first number full-time payroll. I have not seen the detail. This has not been audited or reviewed, but that is um, per library staff the actual cost that pertains to Fairfield Woods branch portion. Uh, Part-time payroll, same thing. Actual costs. Um, so the big numbers are per the library staff, the actual costs, the smaller numbers are allocated based upon the percentages uh, driven by those actual costs. Bob, another way of looking at this is if you just look at the payroll costs, which uh, if I hear what you're saying, you're basically saying that those payroll costs are assigned by who's working where versus Correct. the things that are done at 25 percent. If you look at that out of the 1 million, 120 or 161, 950 of that is personnel costs that are directly attributable. The rest of this are just allocations. Correct Mr. statement. To Mr. Walsh's point, you could take issue with how the allocation is done on, on the items outside of the 950. Yeah. Because they're best guesstimates based on this methodology, right? Correct statement. Right. So you've got essentially $200,000 worth of costs here that are operating costs outside of payroll. That could be 300, that could be 150. Correct. You would be my second choice for uh, clerk of the board. For what? Clerk of the board. Uh. <laughs> and I do appreciate your uh, translation of my comment. No, I just, I just. No, I'm it. serious. Yeah. I'd like to see a listing from, I guess, the library of what staff is a, is a, is assigned to each each of the buildings, and if they're split between them, what the approximate split is. Um, and actually, as a board, what I'd like to talk about is whether, as a board, for the next budget season we should be breaking out Fairfield Woods Library and the main library as two separate budgets, kind of like we do exactly in the same section of this budget for the Smith Richardson Golf Course and the Carl Dickman Golf Course. Um, and those are much smaller numbers, but yet we make them break, break them down. Yeah, I mean, um, this, is, this is, I'm sorry. Because this way we wouldn't have to be wondering what, what the costs are. We would know exactly what they are. Um, and, you know, I think it was very, uh, I thought it was a great exercise, um, and um, I do uh, uh, compliment Mr. Lombardo and, and the Finance Department work in regards to the P&Ls that we got from the Parks and Recreation, because it allowed us to see exactly w whether those operations were profitable, and also what the expenses were for each one. I thought it was a great exercise, and I think it helped in our analysis of that budget. Um, but just as the two golf courses are broken down, Mr. Lombardo doesn't just have one department with all of his, you know, activities in it. He has different operations that we break down into a budget. And I think the golf course is a great analogy because Carl Dickman Golf Course is like $324,000. This is at least a million dollars for the, for, the, for the smaller of the two libraries. And I think it could be a, a good thing to see what costs go into what as opposed to just assigning 25%. We should know which books go to which one what supplies, what, you know, all the expenses. And I don't know whether anybody else. We do the school. We, what? We do that with the school. We do each of the schools. The, 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 the administrative board of education and the central administration break that down. Can we ask the, uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Can we ask the budget committee, uh, Mr. Bolito, under the budget committee, can you guys talk to the finance department about how that might be accomplished and what the 
what the difficulty of that may or may not be going into the next fiscal year for next, for next year. fixed Absolutely. fiscal year's budget Absolutely. to break these in two, what the methodology might be. It's a different one. It's, mm. it's appropriate. It's not. Uh, there will be some changes that would be necessary, some new accounts. There'd be some, mm. some work that would go into it. So, um, but, yeah. Will do. Thank you. So, yeah, good, Mr. About, I mean, the, the total budget is 4.4. Of that 4.4, 3.4 per the staff library has been specifically assigned, uh, which leaves 1 million, which is assigned based upon 25% uh, allocation. Right, which is the 200 and some odd thousand. Right, exactly. I think it would be a good exercise to go through. Sure. Um, the budgets, I think, are large enough to do that for. Um, and I would still like to get the information on these, the detail that Ms. Ronald supplied on the $524,787 of which individuals are out of that money are assigned to Fairfield Woods and which ones are applied to the main library so that I can track them to the budget positions. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Wolf. All right, what else? Anybody else? Anything else? Anybody have any comments they'd like to make? Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right. This is an executive session, so there is no public comment this evening. Um, so we appear to be done. Uh, just a programming note, we do have a regularly scheduled meeting. We have our meeting next week on April 2nd. We have a regularly scheduled meeting on April 4th. I'm contemplating canceling that meeting. There's, there's one small item on the agenda. And, yeah, and we're, we, I think we can push that meeting, and I think, quite frankly, I'm tired of seeing all you guys. So, uh, and, and vice versa, Mr. Right, exactly. Uh, do I have a motion? Yes. Do I have a second? Mr. Stone, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? We're done, everybody. Good night. Mr. Flynn.